Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Thank you so very Thank much you. for Thank joining you. us Thank this you. evening. Thank you. Praise your name. On Late Night with Lisa and Friends Lord. on this Hallelujah. April 10th, 2021. Oh, yes, Lord. I'm so glad that all of you all are here with us. I, ask right now, I think it's going to be an interesting Jesus broadcast name, this evening. We have a full plate for you tonight sister angel is indisposed right now we're gonna uh, go ahead and get started and then she'll join us as soon as she is able yes lord i want to go ahead and begin this evening with prayer dear heavenly father we come before you right now in the name of jesus father we thank you and praise you that we're able to come together again in this broadcast and share with you all who are listening our thoughts our explanations about scripture what the Lord has shown us in these last of the last days that we can share with everyone but father we thank you and praise you for your peace and your undisturbed composure even in these dangerous and dark times. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, right now in the name of Jesus for your blessings in our physical body. And the Lord, that even if we're going through some form of affliction, we know that you're with us always and that you are still the healer no matter what we're going through. And we thank you for that, Lord, right now in Jesus' name that you can get us through. And if we trust in you, we lay hands, we can lay hands on ourselves, even if we don't have a man or woman of God to do so. You said these signs shall follow them that believe. And one of the signs is they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And we thank you for that right now in Jesus name. And we understand that recovery sometimes takes time. Dear Heavenly Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we ask that if anyone has need, that you bless them with whatever their need is, Lord. The strength to get through. If they need finances, that you bless them with finances. If they need peace in their mind, Lord, that you bless them with the peace in their mind. In Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that what we say this evening will be said in love. That everything will always be done in the spirit of love. And that everything we do this evening will bring you glory. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of King Jesus. Amen. Wow. This has been some kind of week. A lot of stuff going on. Hold on, guys. I'm just trying to check and make sure I have not dropped out. Because I remember one time I was just, just chatting away and I <laughs> wasn't even on on air so i have to flip we hear back. you loud and clear we hear you loud and clear thank you so much man i have to flip back and check that's what we were just talking about in the windows here because i don't even know well yeah you'd have to have multi-screens and i don't have enough room for the multi-screens to be able to look at both and kind of just glance at the same time i don't have i don't have room for that i'm not going to try to fool with it but we had to go back and forth between windows and then that 
sometimes that can make you almost lose your train of thought. And then when you're trying to read the chat too, oh yeah. Multitasking is not my strong suit. I can do it. It just ain't my strong suit. Jordan is the one who I understand can actually walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. I haven't worked that one out yet. Jordan, would you like to say good, good evening to everyone? Well, it's funny that you say that after last week when I uh, just happened to turn around and got myself tangled in all sorts of cords. So I appreciate the compliment. I just don't think it's very well founded. <laughs> but hello, everybody. I am super excited to be back. This is going to be a jam packed night. I just, I don't know. I'm really enjoying this. Is my third week on. So I'm super excited to have whatever conversation we have planned for tonight. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Jordan. Yeah, I understand. And I, I forgot to ask you before we started, were you clear of any wires? Did you have like six feet of room? I guess that's the magic number everybody needs to oh, be yeah. safe these days. So you <laughs> you best bet I cleared this area of obstacles. <laughs> okay, good. Hate to hear you go down in the middle of the broadcast. <laughs> we just hear this big crash and we just have to believe the wires got you again. So, all right. It'd be good, good for the news, though. <laughs> it would be good, especially if it was on camera. You want to turn your camera on? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ben, how are, you, how are you doing this evening, Ben? Hey, everyone. It's good. I'm glad to be here. That's Sorry. it. That's all we're going to do. I know I'm boring. <laughs> I'm like an old dusty bathrobe now compared to Jordan and... <gasps> And the super personalities on these on this broadcast. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're not letting you get off that easy. How about this, Ben? Would I be putting you on the spot if I said you might? I know this is totally unscripted, unprepared. And I didn't warn you. I might go here. Um, would it be too much to say you might have a praise report about something you tried that's working for you? Uh, yeah, a, a, a preliminary uh, praise report. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Okay, I'm well, pressure uh, on you tonight. You're gonna have to talk. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, so the uh, again, I kind of stepping back a little bit. Um, well, actually, uh, uh, Lisa last week, I think it was, uh, mentioned that there was a, a this compound called DHEA, uh, and I'm not gonna try to pr pronounce it. But um, I, she, it basically, I, I did a lot of research a, after that uh, about DHEA and what she, what she was saying, and uh, <clears throat> I found that it, it seemed to be definitely something. That <clears throat> Sorry, I got ch choked up. Uh, it definitely sounded like something that would uh, benefit me or potentially benefit me, and so I tried some. And the next day, I, I, I mean, <clears throat> I woke up in the morning. And I felt like, you know, I, I, I felt like uh, I didn't have any problems waking up. It was just like kind of like back in my teenage years where I just kind of bolted up. And I was like kind of re re ready and raring to go. Um, and I, you know, I work out a fair amount and I, I think I take a lot of good uh, supplements and things like that. And I, th those things have certainly helped. But I did always felt like recently, especially, I'm getting older now. Um, I'm uh, almost 48. And uh, I just feel like, you know, it's like I, I'm working out as much as I was a couple of years ago, but um, like just some of the weight that I put on was not coming off as easily. And I just didn't feel like I was, uh, it, I just was, my recovery from those workouts was like a lot longer. It would take me a lot longer to recover. It would take me like two days just to recover, it feels like. And so I took some DHEA. Um, I took actually 100 milligrams. I think that's a little high. That, that's not like the high end of what they recommend. Um but and and it's such a this more research I found that okay well probably twenty five milligrams is probably more reasonable to start off with at least and so I, I've kind of backed down from there but the last couple of days I just feel like uh, like I I tell I told uh, Lisa that it was, I felt like I had that kind of like the inner life glow again my my I don't know I just felt like there was a some kind of life glow in me again and I just felt uh, motivated to do things where before I just was like it was just very difficult um, mm -hmm. and I get stressed out easily too because uh, just because you know, I have a 
there's a lot of things that go on in my life, but it's like, you know, sometimes it's like walk into a house, you know, it's like trying to walk into a house that was previously owned by a hoarder and, and now you had to clean it all up. Like, it's like, where do you start? That's kind of how I feel like my life is a lot of times. It's like, where do I start? So much I want to do, but I don't know where to start. And uh, I just feel like that, that kind of stuff, those kind of thoughts, uh, I just like, I don't care. You know, it's going to start, just start getting busy, you know? And I don't know. I just feel like I've got that motivation back and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to take it. And um, I, I always recommend you do your research. Some people recommend that you definitely do not take it uh, for various reasons. Um, and I think you could probably abuse it. Uh, and certainly, obviously, anything you can abuse. But I'm playing it safe, and I'm taking only 25 milligrams a day. And, I, again, I just feel like that picked me up again. But I'll say this. Again, it's one of those things that they don't really recommend generally if you're, like, under 30 to even bother with it because you're, you're – between the ages of 20 and 30, your body is already producing optimal levels of it. The problem is, is when you get older, it it steadily declines and it declines pretty quickly, that level of DHEA. And again, it's a hormone or a steroid that produces and is involved with all other hormones in your body. So it it, it, it really is uh, kind of the mother of all hormones, essentially. So it, it helps in the produce, production of estrogen and uh, testosterone. And so... Um, I think that's exactly what my problem was that, that I'm just seeing, you know, I'm getting older and my body's not as efficient as it used to be. And it, they call it adrenal fatigue, which is your adrenal glands actually produce it or the majority of it anyways. And as you get older, it just becomes less effective. So, uh, so far so good. I'm, I'm, I feel like, uh, I feel like, um, I'm fixed. <laughs> I, th I told Lisa, I think you might've fixed me because I feel like mm. I, I'm, I'm back, back to what I used to be. So I'm super grateful. And really excited about, um, you know, where it's, what's it going to be like from a month from now? Because that's when they say it, it really, you really start noticing the effects. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to hear that, Ben. Yeah, I was very excited when he texted me. It was early in the morning, day before yesterday. And I was at a text. I said, oh, I wonder who that's from. And he was just like, oh, this, I just feel so amazing. And I was like, well, praise God. That's awesome. I'm glad that it worked for you. Um, and that's why I encouraged all the gentlemen out there to please do your research. Ladies, it can be effective for you, too, in um, different ways, though, it's, but it's still dramatic. And uh, you, you can research what the proper levels are for women to start with. And um, it, it does help you balance your estrogen as well as your testosterone. Women do have testosterone, just not nearly as much as men. So there's a, a bunch of benefits from it, as I was uh, sharing with you last week, so the aging process, cognition, uh, energy, weight loss, just a bunch of different things, hair growth. So, you know, please do your own research and check it out. We're not making any medical claims. We're just uh, offering anecdotal information, which they have not managed to outlaw yet, but don't worry, they probably get around to it. So where are we tonight, guys? Let's see. I think Jordan said, he had a helpful tip, which was astonishing that <laughs> he remembered to do it. I thought, sure, he was going to go, no, I was so busy. I got tied up in a microphone again, and I couldn't do it. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah, I know, Jordan. I'm just going to keep teasing you about the microphone thing because that was hilarious. But please <laughs> go ahead and shed, shed your helpful tip. Yeah, well, I definitely have a Share helpful it, tip, yeah. but I just have to say, like, I'm absolutely floored that Ben told me that he's close to 48. I would have never expected that, but we're going to have to talk about his routine because I want to age like that because like my healthy choice for the week was switching from Reese PCs last week to Cadbury eggs this week. So I got some work <laughs> to do. <But laughs> my oh, helpful <laughs> Definitely going to have to work on your diet, but go ahead. <laughs> My helpful tip is organization. Um, I've personally been having a lot of success using Monday.com. Um, I think being able to rely on planning apps. First of all, I think it it's about learning your personality, first of all, because I don't think every single person is going to benefit from every type of app. So you have to learn 
what type of organization will fit your personality the best. And then once you figure that out, finding an app or something um, that can keep you organized, that can also be readily accessible on all your devices. Because what happens if you leave your planner at home or what happens if your planner is just on your computer, but you need to look something up on your phone? I would just suggest investing in something like that because once you're organized you're not going to forget numerous appointments um with the recent influx of opportunities uh from this ministry it's definitely required me to get organized because as lisa and ben both know i don't sleep if i'm not organized so (laughs) that is my tip I'm sorry, there was an app. What app was that? I'm sorry. Well, I missed it, Jordan. Well, so I use Monday.com personally. Oh, okay. I think, yeah, I I kind of have it filtered by certain projects that I'm working on. I have it filtered by my podcast. So I know like what guests are coming up, who I need to reach out to. And it also lets me know like who I need to follow up with, where we're at in the process of getting them on. Um, it lets you kind of filter it by priority and also like, if you're working on it, if you're stuck, if it's complete, uh, it's just a great way to make sure that everything is all assembled. And I feel like if you can find an app that also sends reminders, um, kind of like a to-do list that will just ping on your phone, that way you don't forget in your everyday busy, I feel that's very beneficial. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jordan. I didn't even know anything about that. Ben comes on here with tech stuff all the time. Uh, ben, I'm sorry. I can't. I told you I can't walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. Angels has asked, could we send her the link for sure. the hangout? Now. Yep. Which is why I was sounding like I had a braid fuse while Jordan was telling us that because I was trying to do both and I can't. I'm not good at this like that. So thank you so very much. And you have to. Make another video, Jordan, so you can show me how to use it. <laughs> so, so I can watch the video and learn and then go, okay, that's it. I got it. So now you have more work to do. Is it free, Jordan? Did he it, fall asleep on the No, I'm so sorry that I, I want I <laughs> I was typing in the chat and then I was like, I forgot I was on mute. My bad. It okay. is free. It's absolutely free. I think you can get an upgraded version, but as long as you're really good about clearing out your stuff, you shouldn't need an upgraded version. Okay. All right. Cool. I'm not again, you're gonna have to make a video so I can even see what you're talking about and then I'll understand. Um, makes me feel bad. I'm getting up there with my mother now and go, how does that work? What is that? What is that about? (laughs) Okay. Um, let's see, where are we tonight? Oh, I was going to do a little bit of trivia and see if I could trip up Mr. Uh, Ben and also the chat. Now this is going to be fun for you guys because you can actually we're on the honor system here. So no cheating and looking up the answers. No Googling it. God is watching you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I'm going to ask a couple of trivia questions here. And then let's see how small, smart you all are. I, by the way, I already knew all these answers. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I'm just kidding. Um, I just have to apologize ahead of time because my competitive side's about to come out and it's ugly. So I'm very sorry about what you're all about to witness. Okay. It's not so ugly that you would cheat and pretend you didn't cheat, right? <laughs> oh, it's not a cheating thing. It is a I'm here to win thing. <laughs> well, no Googling it. Oh, no. Or... Don't you worry. Don't you worry. Or you just might, in the effort of Googling it, trip over those wires again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see how many times I can work that into the conversation tonight <laughs> just to annoy Jordan. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not sorry. Uh, <laughs> all right, here's the question, guys. Are you ready? Drum roll. I'm going to give everybody. I didn't get a chance to get my music. I got to find something that's in the 
public domain that I can get Ben to play for like 10 seconds to get everybody a chance to answer uh, where we wouldn't get a copyright infringement for. So we'll just wing it tonight with, with no, no music. Name the biggest island in the world. And I'm not giving you any oh. choices. So type it in the, don't you dare blurt it out. Junior, <laughs> don't you dare blurt it out. Uh, type it in the chat in all caps. And if you can do it at, at for the most high Jesus so I can see it because it highlights it. And then I'll know if you got the right answer. And I'll tell you in a little bit. Done. <laughs> that was the first one. Were you the first uh, one, Jordan, in the chat? Uh, yes. Done. Bam. I don't even see it. Where is it at? No, not in the in in the meat here. In the actual yeah, chat stream. It's in the actual chat, Lisa. I don't see it. Okay, yeah. well. <laughs> okay, that was a good try. And as they say, it's a good, the old college try. Eh, it's not right. I love no, you, Jordan. Sorry. No, see, that's a lie. That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry, over. but. Well, unless the trivia page I'm using is wrong, which it's is highly wrong. doubtful. It's 100% wrong. Cannot possibly be wrong. Okay. All right. Time's up. Let's see what you guys got in here. Let me re let me look in the chat just a little bit. Just a little bit. Were there any other guesses? Nobody else boldly stepped out? Just I Jordan? <laughs> but just Jordan, not even Ben. Ben, you didn't even try. Okay, Ben, I'm going to come to yours for uh, just for the sake of the broadcast and give you an opportunity. Oh. To redeem yourself here, works works based <laughs> uh, trivia questions. So, what's your answer? Mine, uh, I'll say United Kingdom. That's England. a good guess. I wish I had a buzzer. We're gonna have to work that in too. Eh, no, <laughs> no. I could have cheated, you know. I could have cheated. I know you could have cheated, but God is watching you, so you didn't. Okay, <laughs> actually, Sister Victoria got it right. And I, I trust yeah, her. As soon as she said that, I was like, wow. That actually, <laughs> I was like, wow, that's so... Victoria's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Just about. Uh, yes. Greenland, Sister Victoria. She got it right. Greenland. I wouldn't... I didn't know that. When, when, it, when, I, when I was reading through the trivia questions, I was like, Greenland? Really? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Here's another question. Before I go to it, Ben, were you able to do that? You didn't forget, right? To send that Angel, to yeah, yeah. The problem okay. is she has two two uh two uh phone numbers now, and I'm not sure which one is legit, but I'll do both. Oh, the new one is okay. the one because she said her phone is dead, so yeah. the other one. Okay, thank you. All right, now Jordan, are you a coffee yeah. drinker? Are you a coffee? Yeah, drinker? well, kind okay. of. Morning, Jordan <laughs> is. Oh, well, I just mean that, yeah, okay, for the sake of this question, anybody who's a morning coffee drinker, it's like not, not obsessed, you don't drink it all day long, but you have, you've got to have that first cup of joe, you, you should know this, you really should know this, all right, so ready, here we go, which country produces the most coffee in the world? I'm going to give you guys about 10 I answered. Seconds. Check it out. Check it out. I answered. <laughs> <laughs> Remember now, I'm slow. Zero to 60 eventually. Was that Angel? Yes. Yes. I'm finally here. Yes. Hey, Sister yes. Angel. How are hey, you doing? Hey, guys. Oh, not too bad. Uh, just, uh, well, Joel uh, took that uh, olive oil that you recommended for the kidney stones, and he's being such a baby. Like, he's like, help. Am I supposed to take this olive oil? Like, just swallow it like a teaspoonful? And yes. <laughs> exactly like, like, oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, we have uh, some type of kidney stone situation all of a sudden. It's see, uh... week after week. Isn't that crazy? Like, I can't even believe, like, how this happens every weekend now. We're having some type of like, disaster the past few weeks. But anyway, I'm so glad to be with you guys. Um I don't know exactly where I walked in at. What are we doing right now? Where where are you guys at? Are we on Ben's topic? Actually, no. You're you're we're we're still in 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 uh, the beginning of the broadcast here, having a little fun tonight. 
uh, instead of me offering a helpful tip because Ben had a praise report about his results, uh, his anecdotal information concerning uh, 5-HT, no, DHEA. DHEA, DHEA. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, I, that's on my mind because my mother told me to order his son. We'll talk about it. Actually, before, I, before we go too far, uh, Angel, I don't know if you got my text or not, but uh, I did read there was an account that, um, uh, again, it's probably someone abusing it. This is just anecdotal, but there was a lady okay. who apparently used a bunch of DHEA when she was pregnant, and her daughter, um, as a result, had like uh, menstruation like at age six or eight or something like that. Oh, so, wow. So just be, okay, just yeah. be careful. They, they generally don't it's recommend scary. it, I think, while you're pregnant. So. Yeah, that's what it said on the bottle, but like it almost means nothing, whatever it says on the mm -hmm. bottle when you go to these cheap, like as I just said, it was just at Walmart, but like usually they, they I mean, they just, they, you can't follow any of their advice, their dosage recommendations, like nothing. So I didn't know if that was accurate or not, mm -hmm. but um, I have, yeah, I've only taken it twice. Yeah, I think if you keep it under 10 milligrams, you're fine, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I sent her, I, and I have some other studies for you, Angel, I emailed you study uh, studies that actually said it is even beneficial and prevents uh pregnancies if taken in i mean uh not prevent pre prevents miscarriages if oh, taken wow. in the right amount so re it's a peer-reviewed study by the way it's not just some article it's doctors talking to each other so and and 73 different women in that clinical trial so you might want to check that one out and then i have a couple of others you'll be interested in Awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah, thank you guys. You're welcome. I'm in a well I, I know my little birdies are singing, so I'm gonna mute here to let whoever was talking finish. I'm just looking okay. up some, uh, the details of my helpful tip real quick because I want to make sure that I summarize it correctly. Okay. We'll come yeah. back to you. And you gotta tell your budgies that they're gonna have to step up to the microphone or go on mute if they're gonna preach now. That's just all it is. They're totally. wild and crazy. They're just they're just singing like crazy. I took them with me to the store, so they're <laughs> okay. So All right, I'll talk to you. I'll We're be here. I'm just looking at Yeah, up. no problem. We're doing trivia right now. And the question was in case you want to answer trivia. it before you go. Yeah, sure. that's what I'm doing tonight. So we don't need more competition, uh, Lisa. Oh well <laughs> heck you got it right, so just calm wait, wait. down you this got time, it right? okay? Jordan has warned us. <laughs> yeah, you you got it right, Jordan. No. Go back on mute. Be quiet. <laughs> no, Sister Angel, the question <laughs> before Jordan blurts it out because he's so excited that he won. Okay, he got it before oh. anybody else. Um, which was uh, for coffee drinkers. There, I said everybody should know this. Which country? Is I forgot my own question. <laughs> uh, hold on. Which country produces the most coffee in the world? Don't blurt it out. Um, just yet, but Jordan did get it right. Okay, do you want to take a shot at at the uh, answer? I have no idea. That's a tricky question. Your I want to say it's somewhere in, in Colombia. No. Okay, but no, she's Indonesia. not allowed to play. She, she's not allowed. <laughs> to play. <laughs> oh, I'm not going oh, to yet. I don't, think, Jordan. I don't think I am. Jordan, <laughs> I've never done it. Oh my goodness, Jordan. I got I didn't have my glasses on. I don't even wear glasses. You didn't get it right, Jordan. Oh, that would be so funny. I, I beg your pardon. <laughs> this is hysterical. <laughs> and Sister Angel, what what was your answer against this Angel? You said Colombia. I said like Colombia or Indonesia. No. I didn't sorry. really land on one yet. <laughs> did anybody get it right? Okay, let me check the chat. Ben, did you want to answer? Did you want to take a I'll say Mexico. Shot? Mexico. No, Mexico. Okay. You know, I, I was actually going to, you guys are funny because I was going to set this up and give people multiple choice with the right answer in there. And mm -hmm. those were the two countries I was going to pick, which was Mexico and Colombia. But let me go back. I got to go through. I'm sorry, Jordan. I was looking at the wrong thing. You're, you're not right, sweetie. I'm sorry. You know what? Nobody calls you trauma. No, it's Put, fine. This is just going to be my from last. The peanut butter, eggs. <laughs> this is just going to be my last week appearing on this broadcast. I just. Oh. <laughs> 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 All right. I'm so sorry. I was looking at the wrong thing, and I thought he got it right. I didn't mean to. I, I just feel like I I'm being messing with him. No, 
No, I was looking at the wrong thing. Victoria got it right again. First, out of everybody. Okay. I think uh, we're going to well, have to ban her from the trivia questions. She's she's gotten right two in a row. What was her answer? Bra Brazil. Oh, okay. it, see, it, see, it's all South America. How are we going to know from one year to the next <laughs> which one is beating the other in terms of coffee production? I mean, come on. I'm sure it was Colombia like five years ago. I'm sure they go back and forth. <laughs> this is silly. I still okay. feel like I'm right. I, I agree. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, that that's a very valid point. Very astute because actually a notation here is last year Mexico's coffee production was estimated to be around 4.5 million bags, but Brazil beat them out this year. Mexico, I'm surprised. I would think mm. knowing what I know about coffee plants, I would just be surprised that they would like thrive in what I would I mean not, I would think they would country. drive farther south. Yeah, I know, but like compared to some of the more like humid and <laughs> okay. uh, mm -hmm. jungles that are that are down Look. there, they could be. I don't know, uh, but uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, and my 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 uh, my little response was not astute. It was extremely <laughs> immature. It's like I play games. I'm, I don't like losing. I never I never used to play games. <laughs> I get too crappy when I lose. Oh, not really. I'm not. Really okay. But I Angel, I'm stacking the deck in your favor on this question. I'm stacking okay. the deck in because you're the, or you're our resident animal expert, and this is concerning an animal. Oh, so I'd be very surprised if you don't know. Jordan's right. a pretty big in animals too. <laughs> oh, really? I if did not know shark, that. If it's okay. a shark, I'm gonna win. I <laughs> uh, no, I'm. Okay if it's a shark. If it's a shark, I'm gonna win, Jordan. I too love sharks. I too That's want to be a marine biologist after I saw Jaws. Yes, go on, go on, Lisa, do it. Okay, what color? You better ask me. Carcare and Megalodon. Hey, go on. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, I don't even think sharks qualify as animals. Aren't they oh, like fish? Yeah. Yeah. What is wrong with They're you? fish. Oh, okay. fish are animals. They're not plants, Lisa. They're fish. Yeah, they're, they're not animal kingdom. <laughs> yeah, right, I'm gonna have to look that up. Kingdom. I think you guys are both wrong on that, but well, that's because you're you animal they're lovers. Do you think they're plants? <laughs> <Animalia. laughs> we're animals too, according to science. No, they're not mammals. So I thought animals were mammals. No, mammals are that's mammals. Like animals specific. are animals. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even insects. Animal. Even insects yeah, are animals. classified as animals, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? For real? Yeah. This, this is where, this is where a real conversation mean, needs to be tonight. Just because I didn't go to college <laughs> yeah. for more than a few minutes doesn't mean you guys get to play with me because you all have degrees. That's not fair. Okay. I don't have a degree. You don't have a degree, Ben? Oh, you fooled no, me. So that was I'm my trivia for tonight. You, proud without one. You stumped me. Proud not to have one. Oh, thank you. See, okay, been so Ben and I are on one side of the camp. Yeah, I've been getting away with yeah, it. Yeah, Ben's just fine without a degree. Okay, let me get to the question. Let me get the, people out there screaming going, what the heck is the question? Okay, what, yeah. what color is a giraffe's tongue? Purple. Blue. I don't know. What do you think, Jordan? It's, we're supposed to type it in the chat. <laughs> well, she can't. Oh, no, Angel gets to blurt it out because she doesn't have a computer, so she gets. To... Oh, that's not fair! I didn't know. I didn't know. No, it's okay. okay. I'm gonna hide shut now. No, you you can blurt it out because you don't have a computer. You get the exception. Well, Jordan is on punishment, so he has uh, to type it. On punishment he's for so what? Being awesome. That, but also <laughs> for being so competitive. <laughs> That we have to we have show. to make it fair for everybody. <laughs> You're so lucky I don't have a little wrench because I'd be muting everyone in the chat right now. <laughs> oh well then Ben, make sure that Jordan never gets a wrench. Okay. Did anybody answer that? I did. Look at the chat, Lisa. <laughs> I don't see it. What am I going blind here or something? You know what? I don't I I wrote it in the chat. If anybody wants to make an exposed video of how Lisa's playing me tonight, I will actually pay them. Yeah, that's 
that needs to happen. Yeah, we need to, we need to do that. Oh my for goodness. The most time, those, <laughs> Look at how quickly we turn on the host. <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> The competition. If you had just I asked this. a sharp question, Lisa. We were going to find out who's really saved tonight because of the trivia <laughs> questions. <laughs> okay. I don't see I any answers in the chat. I my answer because I really don't. I really don't. I, I can't say well, Angel, answer, you were kind of right. Angel, you okay. were half right. There's Okay, how about well, yeah, this? Yeah, I said two different it's colors. Two colors. <laughs> it's two colors. They're actually like a blended color. So, mm -hmm. Angel, you oh, got really? one of them. Yes, you did. It is purple. I keep losing my window for the answers. I'm sorry. It is blue. Excuse me. Blue and black. I just play with everybody's emotions again. Blue, black. It's blue, black. Yes. Yes. Okay, guys. One more. If we can get through that, I'm going to do one more trivia this question. This isn't fun anymore. I know. I'm sorry. I didn't see Jordan. Can you go read? Because I can't do. I cannot walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. Can you go read the chat and see if anybody else got it right, please? No, everybody was wrong. I was the only one. One color. Right. You were the only I, one. Okay. Yeah. I, so sorry, sorry. is that old? Isn't that old for like three or, or no? Wait. When you okay, you got one out of three right. So yeah, I actually changed my username to Victoria Davis. <laughs> Oh, is that <laughs> what's going on? That's why I'm getting all these right answers. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm here for you. Ben, are you able <laughs> to remotely mute Jordan's microphone? <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> okay, keep that handy. Keep that handy. All right. Let's see. All right. Oh, this ought to be. Well, I don't know. You guys, you guys are not. So I'm Generation X. Angel, are you generate? Are you a millennial too? Because you're right there with Jordan. I'm you're not, like only a few I, years. Yeah, we're we are the okay. like quintessential millennials. I mean, oh. I, I I don't know exactly Jordan's age, but I was twenty nine. Uh, like I just started high school when the when nine eleven happened, and I graduated no four. So I started at high school in two thousand. So yes, I'm I, okay. I'm a millennial and uh, okay. You know, not not to be proud of it or anything. I wanted to be Gen X so bad <laughs> when I was a kid. I cried. Well, I cried when I was you really? I know it's when I realized cool, I yeah. wasn't Gen X. Yeah, I was really. I'm upset. Gen X. <laughs> and then, yeah. Ben, are you Gen X? Ben, did you make? I, it? I must. Be, I I believe so. I'm 48, almost 48. So I I believe. Yeah. I'm, okay. You're you're a Gen Xer. So we got Gen X. We got millennials. And then I think your guest uh, the other night. He say he was. Do you remember? Because he was younger, uh, than, much younger than you. He's Gen Z, much younger. Yeah. Gen he's like Z only a was. couple of years younger. I'm not ancient. <laughs> How does it feel? How does it feel? Get he's ready because that's coming. So buddy. Much You're about to hit thirty. <laughs> uh, he's so oh, yeah. much younger than you. Okay, so this is a trivia question about television. So I think the Gen Xers got a chance here. I don't oh, know about you, no. millennials. You Todd <laughs> millennials. I don't know. I don't watch TV. <laughs> oh, you don't watch TV. <laughs> Jordan's going to really think I stacked against the deck against him, but I did really not. Did. I'm so out of here. <laughs> oh, oh, Ben. Ben, you should get this one. If you watch TV, yeah. you should get this one. Okay. Do you think I what? watch TV? <laughs> no, Do you not. really think I watch TV? No, sir. I'm talking Lay about when me. you were. Lay when on you me. were. Just a, a, gen, a Gen Xer, like yeah. everyone else on Saturday, sitting in front of the TV. That's when I watched TV. I haven't watched TV since Gen X was cool. I mean, since Gen X was young. I mean, since Gen X was like on TV. I'm sorry, I was messing with you. I haven't watched TV since back then. So I'll probably get yeah, it back in the I covered wagon days. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, was wearing, I was wearing parachute pants when I went back. <laughs> that's when I watched TV. Yeah. <laughs> Well, then you still might get this guy. because reruns and stuff, who knows? Okay, you guys still have a chance. <laughs> what, was <the> first <laughs> what was the first toy to be advertised on television? What the heck? That's not a Gen X question. That's like, Why a, not? That's like a boomer question. That's a boomer question. Okay, go on. Though. You don't slinky. Think you think I'll say slinky. Slinky. You don't think, wait, wait. Uh, Sister Angel is challenging my integrity here. <laughs> By saying, yeah, I 
you weren't. Yeah, I'm just saying. Like, I think Gen Xers were probably too young to, rem- you know, almost too young to remember what the first like toy commercial was, right? Well, I remember first of all, the. They well, they did advertise it, but I guess it. Yeah, okay, it's saying 1952. First of all, oh, like okay, there's a hint. Question. Okay, how about that? I'll give you. I'm giving you a hint. I mean, come on. It was first advertised on April 30th, 1952. It what is it, because oh, yeah. if you go back and think about the toys from 1952, y'all. Oh, let me just pull out my old movie ever. ever? <laughs> Don't you cheat! God is watching you, boy. <laughs> All right, now. Oh yeah, let me let me consult my mental inventory. Of okay, all Ben. Never mind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> never <here>. mind. <laughs> we'll, we Gen Xers will stick together on this one, Ben. Did you have an answer? I said a slinky. Actually, I... you know that's a good guess, but it's not. It's not right. But a slinky said, was from around that time. Yes. Radio flyer. I said Mr. Potato Head, but I don't think that's politically correct, and I might be canceled tomorrow morning for saying that. Actually, I think we have to take his microphone for saying that. <laughs> Sister Angel, what was your answer? I said a radio flyer. That was a radio good flyer. guess, too, because that, that's why I was hoping you guys could at least throw in on this, because you're, even though, you know, borderline... You know, the other thing. Borderline. <laughs> the little toddler thing. But even I though... I really attacked tonight. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Let's go to the chat. I hope everybody took a... Uh, okay, Barbie was a good guess, but no. Barbie was in that era. She was 1959. Okay, so uh, you, 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 you're close. That was a good guess, by the way. Slinky was a good guess because those are all from that time period. I'm going back. You guys, I told you guys to put it like at me so it would highlight. Now you're making me work because I got to read. Okay. Nope. I don't see it. If anybody got it, then then um, just highlight me and say, I did answer it. You missed it. And I'll, I'll give you the proper props. Okay. Are you ready? Drum roll, please. Who's going to do the drum roll? Nobody. <laughs> They're mad. They're mad at me right now. The answer is Mr. Potato Head. Oh, Jordan. Yeah, wow. I know. He got it right. That's why I drug it out as long as I didn't want him getting a big head like Mr. Potato Head. Oh my god. <laughs> what? Well, I, don't know. I didn't know Mr. Potato Head was that old. Congratulations. Yes, me neither. Congratulations, Woo! Jordan. Oh, <laughs> I just, I don't know if we're going to be able to carry on with the broadcast. I might have to find somebody else to do this. I don't think we can manage being on here with Jordan in a big head, too. I just, I don't. Thank you guys for participating in the trivia. It was fun. I think we'll do it again when we come back on the next broadcast. If you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, can you put it in the chat? Let me know if you enjoyed it. Uh, How about putting... Uh, one in the chat. If you enjoyed it and you like to do it again, because I, I just thought we should have a little bit of fun. Um, this is the kind of stuff we would do if we actually did hang out, like barbecue, and you know, have our non-alcoholic beverages and sit up and talk without gossiping and have fun, right? So sounds good. You I, get your place next weekend. <laughs> hey, don't play with me now, y'all. T- y'all the ones got to fly to me. It's all right with me. So. <laughs> You can come, jump jump on a plane, get the red eye, and come on out here. All right. Just for the record, I'm the only one in the chat that put one, (laughs) but I was also the first, so I win again. (laughs) You're always the, oh, he had to point that out, that he was the first. I was the one, just like I am in life. See, I'm getting tied up here because I'm trying to go back to my window to see the chat. And I told you I can't walk and juice bubble gum and I keep losing the window. Okay. Thank you guys for participating. I appreciate it. We got a couple of ones. Somebody put a four. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but okay. Thank you. I guess they wanted it one four times. So we'll just count that as one four times. Okay. <laughs> They're saying one. You know, I, I forgot the stream is like a little, a uh, few seconds behind. So. Praise God. Praise God. They said, yeah, do it again, please. Okay. All right. You got it. We'll do it again when we come back together. And um, no, Jordan, I will not give you the answers in advance. So don't even 
email me, text me. No, I will not do it. I would say never. You would never. Okay. Uh, Victoria's out there bragging. She says, I beat you, Jordan. LOL. I got to go. <laughs> Did she beat you for real? Okay. Thank you, sister. Thank you for taking him down a, a notch. We appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you so very much. I needed to know that you beat Jordan. That is so pleasing. See, that's what Miss Potato Head looks like for all you millennials that didn't know there was actually a Mr. And they did bring his wife along too later on. I don't know if they did the children, but they did have a Mrs. Potato Head too. And I actually did have one of those things. Even though I was born considerably after the, the start of that toy, I'm sure my mother would remember when they introduced that. That was more along her time period. And congratulations to Sister Angel. She was right. It was more of a gen. What did you call No, boomer. More of a boomer, boomer. question. She was, she's right. You were right. Well, you know, hey, I, I can't keep track of all this stuff. You brainiacs are supposed to do that. All right. I was just doing your favor so nobody thought you were around when watching commercials at 1952. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, what's funny is I was, but in a different way, because when you would go back and watch some of the, um, the old uh, mm -hmm. movies and cartoons, sometimes they would leave the old commercials in. As I love a that. Fun thing. Yeah. And so I saw a lot of this stuff. So anyway, I know that was a dig on the slight angel, but I'm going to let it go and I'm still going to leave you on my friends list. So now, uh, you said you had a helpful tip. Yes, basically, um, you know, I'll keep it kind of short, but um, I kind of, I came across this book recommendation and like somebody played some of the audio. It's called The 10X Rule by Grant Cardone. And normally I'm not like super into self-help books, but um, I liked that this guy, uh, like some of the stuff he was talking about because he like put into words a lot of what I feel like God showed me after getting saved um, about like taking accountability and like how you can never do it too much. And basically um, I, I feel like God, um, once I got saved, you know, he showed me that a really big part of what was keeping me from the mentality that allowed me to be humble enough to, um, you know, embrace the gospel was this lack of accountability and this like excuse making. Now I was never one for like, like you could go back to my extensive and embarrassing social media history and you won't see me playing the victim like often if at all, because to me that felt like embarrassing to me, like to me that to, to admit that somebody had victimized me or gotten the better of me was just, there's another way of saying I'm a loser and they're a winner. So I didn't uh, do it that often, but I did mentally in my head not take accountability for things in my life the way that I should have. Now, um, since, you know, uh, becoming a believer, God has really uh, seemed to hammer home that I could never go wrong finding a way in which whatever situation I find myself in is somehow my fault. It, it, not to beat yourself up, but to show yourself what you could do differently. How you could perhaps, you know, try to prevent it next time rather than to blame somebody else or blame external circumstances, you know, because that doesn't do you any good. It doesn't actually you don't actually benefit from that in the end, even if even if uh, something is really like, you know, a hurricane really out of your control. Right. The fact mm -hmm. that you lost power for two weeks, you didn't have a generator, you know, and, and so all your food spoiled. You know, you could have had a generator, basically, instead of being like, woe is me, this hurricane, and disaster. Next time, I'm going to have a generator. That's the mentality to have, right? Well, I came right. across this guy named Grant Cardone, and his, he's got this uh, book called The 10X Rule. And it's basically mm -hmm. like the, the 10X, I think it refers to, um, you know, anticipate doing 10 times more work than you anticipate having to do in order to achieve your goals. And um, mm -hmm. I think it's really great for men. I think his advice is really great for men, especially, but... The thing I really loved was he was just talking about um, how uh, how people that, that go through life feeling like victims, um, you know, and I could think of like my aunt, had, you know, in, in the past had the tendency to do this. Um, and like where just bad things happen to them all the time. It, 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 that's how they look at it. Like it's all it's all luck. It's all they have bad luck. It's, you know, it's all by chance or just poor me. Typically those who will 
who will um, play the victim um, find themselves in the role of victim quite often because they attribute all failure to external forces. And he's pointing mm -hmm. out that basically when, when you consider yourself a victim of someone else, you have given them all the power. And then you no longer have the power to change your outcome and your circumstances. Because if you're a victim, then that means that uh, you're, you are helpless in the situation and, and, and you will continue to be helpless in similar situations if you had no, no ability to change what, um, what ended up you know, transpiring. And I think that like for men especially today, this is important because I, I see that uh, especially with like the whole feminism thing and you know, the attack on men and masculinity, I see a lot of men kind of being tempted by victim status now, you know, because mm -hmm. of the way the court systems are set up, you know, and the, you know, family court, you know, it, they feel, um, they feel like uh, everything is, the scales are all tipped against them. Right. And I mm -hmm. think it's a really incredible illustration of how you could actually turn, you know, turn it around and figure out where, where their accountability is in the situation. And what's the name of the book? The last, it's called the 10 X rule by Grant Cardone. How do you spell that? Um, Cardone, um, okay, Grant, G-R-A-N-T, and okay. Cardone is C-A-R-D-O-N-E. Yeah, I read the book, but that's why I'll find it. I'll find it, thanks. The audio book is really entertaining. I really, I was, mm -hmm. when I was listening to excerpts of it. But basically, you know, it's, it's just, he, he just gives lots of different examples of different situations where a lot of people would enjoy, like, even if somebody rams into the back of you, right, mm -hmm. um, uh, while you're on the way to work. Well, uh, surely that's not your fault. That's somebody else's fault. But this is a mental exercise that's beneficial because he points out, well, had you not taken that road, you might not have ended up in that situation. Had you been going a little bit slower or a little bit faster? And although that might seem unreasonable, the point is if you apply that into all sorts of different situations in life that are more complex than somebody running into you, then you'll always find a way to where instead of shoving the blame off on somebody else and thus giving them all the power for your circumstances, um, you can, you empower yourself and you also mm -hmm. give yourself the ability to make changes and, and, and change your circumstances for the better. And um, it just sort of like, it was really good to hear somebody voice what I, I kind of just felt going on inside of me since, you know, coming to know the Lord where he just never lets me, point the finger at anybody like literally like I don't ever get to feel like a victim and point the finger at anyone like I just don't I don't anymore like you just even in my mind like I don't ever get to do that he always you know this little voice that tells me like well just check me just check me the minute I try to do that or mm -hmm. even try to make a victim of anybody else even try mm -hmm. to try to you know um think of anybody else as well although surely they're victims God will you know, it's almost like a devil's advocate thing where he'll find a way where, no, okay, that person that you're trying to, to turn into a victim, let me show you like where, where, where they played into their own circumstances. And, and it, it, it's it, because it's healthy because it's never healthy for a person to sit and um, wallow in, for, for grownups, especially, you know, to, to mm -hmm. make either yourself as a grown up the victim or to make other grownups victims in your mind because i don't i don't believe that there there really is such a thing because you know at the end of the day that would also mean being victims of god's will right because a lot of what you know god god has a reason why anything ha that happens in life you know why it happens to you i mean there's a purpose for it in the end um even a lot of bad things that happened to me ended up causing me to be saved become a believer so um mm -hmm. and i and i think that i just think that today what i see is like I feel like Satan is, is tempting all of society with this, this, this victim mentality, but especially now I feel like men are, you know, and the thing is, is it was sort of the original, you know, one of the, one of the first things Adam ever did wrong, right. After the, after, you know, you know, he ate along mm -hmm. with Eve, what did he do? He pointed the finger. You know, I think that that was a really, you know, like the, the, the fact that that was one of the first things that Adam did wrong, mm. it, it, it tells you that there's a, there's a real um, weakness or, or Satan likes to exploit this weakness in men where, where if he can get the men to point the finger at, because he pointed the finger at Eve and God himself for creating mm. Eve for the situation that he found himself in because of his own choice.
Mm-hmm. And um, I think that it's really important. And it's, this applies to women also. I mean, women absolutely need to uh, to take accountability for their own actions. But it's I, th- I just think for all society, it's even more toxic if men begin to, to, to embrace the idea that, that they're not accountable for their circumstances. Because, um, well, basically, let's just face it. You know, I, I, I think uh, men are, you know, more rational. On, on average, and men are uh, t- typically a bit tougher. And so if even men are not willing to take accountability for their circumstances, because it should, like, I don't, I'm, a, I'm a female, but it challenged my manhood uh, when I was younger to think of myself as a victim. I don't have manhood, but that's how it felt. Like, I wouldn't have, I, I, I used to, to think of different situations, like, like you know, hypotheticals that I could find myself in and what I would do because I was just so, like, uh, I guess you could say prideful in a way where like, I couldn't imagine, like I would, I would game out situations where even if something like really awful happened to me, I would still get the upper, keep the upper hand by some slip Mm. remark I'd make or whatever, because I could never let anybody feel like they were getting one over on me. Right. And so, and you know, obviously it's kind of an immature instinct, immature impulse, it's pride. But the point is, is that if you, um, if you, like if even I as a female felt like I like that that was somehow like an affront to my masculinity or something to, to, to admit somebody, you know, somebody got the best of me or something like that and play the victim. Mm-hmm. Then I, it, you know, it, it's got to be an indication of be real unhealthy for men to, mm-hmm. to be comfortable with that, to be comfortable mm-hmm. deciding, you know, I guess, yeah, like they're victims of women or they're victims of feminism when in reality uh, women could, none of this could have happened had men not, for some reason, decided to go along with it, right? And that, that's mm-hmm. a really important thing to remember. So I think Grant Cardone, because I had been worried about this, this tendency, especially like in the men's rights movement, you know, and like what they call the manosphere, to just sort of like wallow in like, just, you know, finger point to just blame it, just, you know, and not take, not, not to look at themselves at all, like, upset that women are promiscuous, but they're promiscuous at the same time. Like, it's just, you know, like a lot of, a lot of hypocrisy and unaccountability. Um, and I found that this guy was, a, would be a really good cure for that mentality because he's a very successful man and he has some really great advice about, um, you know, practical matters. And I don't know for sure if he's Christian or not. I do feel as though what I heard in the audiobook, he definitely approached everything from a, a, a biblical foundation in terms of how he explained um, a man's responsibilities and things like that in life. So, um, but I mean, it, it's helpful for women too. Like I, I should have listened to the whole thing. If, if the, if the person that I was, uh, the, the, the YouTube channel I was watching would play the whole thing. So, um, anyway, that's my helpful tip, but, uh, you guys check it out. It's actually entertaining. It's not like cheesy, like a lot of, uh, self-help uh, books, or at least that I would think self-help books often are. I don't, I have never actually read one, but, um, this mm-hmm. one was entertaining. Okay. Well, Angel, I had a question for you. I, I mm-hmm. wanted to ask before I forget, and then I have one for Jordan. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, is he coming from a biblical worldview? Is he a believer, or is this just totally um, secular in this approach? I don't, I, I think that he, at the very least, he approaches, like he's not writing it for Christians, but I distinctly mm-hmm. remember when I was listening to his audiobook, I felt that he, every like that it was a biblical perspective like he was mm-hmm. uh uh seeming to hearken to biblical um uh, like biblical premises like in terms of like i said for what a man's duties are and things like that so that was part of why it resonated with me is because he had he was very firmly footed in uh, things that are consistent with um uh, a biblical understanding of creation from what okay. i heard but, you know, normally if some, you know, as long as somebody doesn't throw off red flags because they're coming from a foundation that is totally like anti-biblical, then, it, you know, I can listen to it because, you know, mm-hmm. whether he's Christian or not, it definitely sounds like he has a, a uh, he's been influenced by mm-hmm. uh, a Christian worldview in the way that he approached this book. Definitely for sure. And I do believe that he did actually, now that I'm thinking about it, he did actually mention um, God. And uh, uh, he he could actually just be dirt, like overtly Christian. Now that I'm thinking about it, mm-hmm. I think he was. Uh, I think he did actually allude to that uh, several times directly. So, uh, uh, but I I haven't actually looked that up. Uh, but I don't think it's written exclusively mm-hmm. for Christians. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't like a Christian men's like you know motivational right. book. It's just 
but I, but I, but he just sort of seems to come from that perspective. So. Okay. And then since the book you were saying is primarily, I guess it's directed at all people, but maybe primarily men, would you, would you say that's accurate? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, certain women too are like really into, you know, achieving, but it's really like about how to, how to kick ass and take names. If you, if you, <laughs> excuse my French, like how to, the he, uh, you know, he, he's a business, uh, he's like a entrepreneur, right? So mm -hmm. it's for anybody with an entrepreneurial mindset, but okay. I do think that he specifically talked to, like a, a lot of what he's talking about in order to, to explain and justify his arguments is what a, like what a man's duties are, what the, what are the qualities of a man? Like what should a man be? What's a, you know, what are, uh, like, what's a positive, healthy masculinity, right? So I do think it's, mm -hmm. it's generally directed at men. But, um, but I mean, you know, women can absolutely benefit from it, too, because it's especially the accountability part. Because a lot of women are really averse to accountability. You know what I mean? So, like, a lot, you know, a lot of women, you, they'll, they'll keep an argument going for, for hours just to avoid having to say sorry right you know and they'll just take you and loopy loop so it's you know certainly not just men that are that are struggling with accountability i think women it's almost you know it's almost like uh, expected of a lot of women that they don't that they won't admit that they're wrong that's what mm -hmm. joke men make all the time is that you can be happy or you can be right right when <laughs> in marriage right so so women can certainly benefit <laughs> from this too <laughs> <laughs> you can be happy or you can be right. Um, yeah, or that old expression of mommy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? Right. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, then my my next question was actually more direct to Jordan. Jordan, are you going to get the book? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I've purchased like 60 some books. Well, not they're not all purchased in the last couple months, so I'm always down for a good read. You okay, can just listen gonna... to highlights and stuff on the audio, like on YouTube. I'm sure you can find some audio highlights. That's yeah. what I was gonna do, so. The reason I'm asking is after what we just witnessed during the trivia section uh, of the broadcast, I would strongly recommend you consider getting this book. <laughs> and I have a couple of books to send you, Lisa, about lies <laughs> and deceit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay wait hold up hold up now now you just put that right out on the broadcast could you please explain in what context that is relevant oh because absolutely. i did not I, cheat during the trivia game yeah yeah i don't want people to get the wrong idea about lisa so lisa told me i was right about something and completely <laughs> lied to my face <laughs> <laughs> making me look like a fool <laughs> So I don't want people to, <laughs> I don't want to misrepresent Lisa like Okay. That. So, yeah. In the, <laughs> in the spirit of the book that Angel just talked about, I will take full accountability and say that I made a mistake. And I do believe mm -hmm. that I pointed out on the broadcast that I made a mistake and read the answer wrong. I had the wrong mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. I did. Yes, I did. Go back mm -hmm. Play it back, everybody, and then come back and put it in the chat and say, She sure enough did. So just <laughs> miss me with that one. Okay. Thank you very much. I stand correct as usual. Anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we have come to the thank you, Angel, for that, by the way. That I, I oh. am interested in that, and I'm probably going to gift that to a lot of people. <clears throat> yeah. It would be good. It's entertaining too. So it, it, it would be, it's really an entertaining thing, but I think it would help. I mean, seriously, it would help a lot of guys, especially young guys, because he really makes you feel stupid for trying to feel like a victim. <laughs> like mm. even, We're trying to feel like, like, uh, to, 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 like situations are beyond your control. I mean, he, he's not nasty, but I mean, it's just, his argument is really rock solid. And a lot of men, especially if they didn't, you know, uh, have not only not a lot of guys have dads, today but they don't have strong fathers i've noticed that mm -hmm. like a lot of a lot of fathers that i you know even my dad in a lot of ways was not as strong as he should have been um and you know so even if they have dads they they didn't have a dad who really raised them properly in terms of like teaching them these things um and kicking their butt when when it needed to be kicked and this is kind of like uh, you know honestly uh, uh, it, what he's talking about is it, it, he kind of like 
this is one of the things dads are supposed to teach you when you're a young mm-hmm. man. And, and he does it uh, for those who maybe didn't have have that, you know, uh, advantage uh, growing up, you know, especially modern day, right? Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I can only imagine, like, you know, people whose parents are Gen Xers and millennials. It's got to be rough because, mm-hmm. you know, the boomers kind of uh, kind of failed, uh, you know, our generation quite a bit so, somehow, you know, like they had a really good stable upbringing, you know, and traditional, you know, family uh, dynamics and, <laughs> and a lot of uh, ethics that were kind of, you know, taught by the, I guess, the silent generation, the greatest generation. And then somehow the boomers just like crapped out for a whole lot of them. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, like they, they got that upbringing, but they didn't have, like my dad's a boomer. He didn't, he didn't pass on a lot of that. Uh, just like just basic common sense. Like he wasn't, uh, I think that, that somehow it became too difficult to compete with the media, at, you know, at some point in raising a child um, sometime around, you know, seventies and eighties. You know, like when I was, mm-hmm. I was born in the late eighties and I, I really feel like somehow that the media took, took root so, so completely that, um, I, I always felt like I was raised by the television more so than my family. Right. And it, that's a lot mm-hmm. to compete with. So I think that this is really just a, a the kind of pep talk a lot of guys need and, and, and it would make them feel a lot better too in the end, because they would see, they would see that, that that really the, the only thing standing in their way is them. And he really just like, lays that out really well. And I just, uh, you know, I feel for guys, for young men today, because I know it's, it's not easy uh, when, especially when you, you know, when your dad didn't guide you or he wasn't even there in the first place, you know, because our family, you know, units are just falling apart. So, so th- finding mm-hmm. things like this can be really great, you know, like little uh, like books or, or, or teachers who, can kind of fill in that role that a lot of us mm-hmm. were missing, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm really interested, Angel. I am. I, I think I'm, I, if you saw how many books I have sitting here waiting for me mm-hmm. to read right now that I'm behind in, uh, I think I'm going to try the audio book version on this one, but I'm definitely yeah, going to, yeah. especially since you say it's, it's very entertaining. And I always like when people, can uh you know add humor to what they're trying to share with you so i'll I think send I'll you a link to the video i okay. heard actually so you can okay. see exactly well, see, like what what i came across and i think you'll like it so i think thank you'll like you the so guy who much. was making the video too <laughs> okay thank you i'm looking forward to it okay we've come to that point in the broadcast i have to take a deep breath here because i'm going to be turning the mic over here to what appears no I, I, I won't go there yet. I'll give him one more week to hang himself and then I'll go there. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> before I just let him have it. <laughs> you hear okay. she's talking about Jordan, you, Ben. Mr. Jordan, are you ready to roll with <laughs> your topic for this evening? <laughs> no, I, was... <laughs> I am. Um, I was actually wondering because okay. I've been talking to um a friend of ours who popped in tonight who um is of the Islamic faith, and I was wondering if I could take just a couple of minutes of my time to kind of answer his question because I was trying to do it in chat, but that's stupid two hundred character limit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Um, but as some of you know, and hopefully he'll stop in tonight, our brother Nasir and his dad Abdus um they had just recently became Christians. Um, So I'm very interested in answering this question. Jamal, I definitely encourage you to email me because I won't be able to fully get into everything, but I hopefully will get you um, seeing things that you may not have seen before and then kind of take it from there. So my email is revivalistforchrist at gmail.com. Just let me know if you need me to put it in the chat. It's just my username at gmail.com. Um, as far as the Islamic faith goes, I know that there is a lot of claims out there. Well, let me get to your initial question about how we can know that Jesus is God and kind of, um, I know that is, uh, the Islamic faith will say that that's polytheism. Um, so the Godhead, essentially what that is, is God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit in one. It is not polytheistic. Uh, the Bible tells us there are three that bear witness in heaven. And that is God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. 
um, I'll explain what the gospel message is and why it was important for God to become man, that man being Jesus Christ to begin with. But there's a lot of verses in the Bible that point to the deity of Jesus Christ. A lot of Muslims try to do um, trap arguments where they'll say, you need to find me a verse that says specifically that Jesus says, I am God. And of course, he's not going to talk like that. Um, but the I think the go-to verse is just in John 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then when you hop over to Revelations 19, 13, we see that Jesus is the word of God. So we know that the word is Jesus, and we know that the word was with God, and the word was God. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I just had a cup. So I have some things pulled up here that I wanted to, um, cause I I've worked with a couple of Islamic people in the past. I also have friends. So I have some things saved on my computer and I was kind of just briefly browsing through some of them. Um, but before I hop into kind of some of the things I have pulled up, the one thing that I want to also suggest to you is the claim that they say that the Bible is full of contradiction that's been manipulated in time. And historically, that's just not true. We've had thousands upon thousands of manuscripts all lining up. You know, the Bible is written over the course of a couple thousand years by 40 authors on three different continents without one contradiction. And we have this man that pops up in six to seven hundreds named Muhammad who wants to make all these bold claims, um, claiming to be a prophet of God, which it's if he was a prophet of God and the claim being that Jesus is a prophet. My first question is, why is Muhammad the only prophet who was not an Israelite? That's the first thing that I ask. Second of all, does he bear the same fruits that the other prophets had? We know that Muhammad was a tyrant. We know that he married a six-year-old girl and consummated that marriage at the age of nine. So he was a pedophile. We know that he, um, when he first had his quote-unquote revelation, it, it the what he said was the archangel Gabriel appeared to him and was forcing his head into um, the the Quran is what he was saying at the time. And he kept pulling him back despite running in fear and trying to escape. And it wasn't until his wife said that, oh, no, that wasn't a demon. That was an angel. Because he actually thought he had encountered a, a demon. Because I don't know why I'm stuttering. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but we know that um, there... Um, I'm so sorry. I just got really distracted. Um, but we know that there, let me just gather my thoughts. I don't know why I got so distracted there for a minute. I think there was just too much happening on my computer. So the he thought he was a demon. And so when he went to his wife, he said that I had seen a demon. She said, no, that's the archangel uh, Gabriel. So we also know that he had attempted to kill himself three times. So there's just a lot adding up of this man is so different compared to other the other quote unquote prophets. Jesus was not a prophet. But when we look at the fruits of Jesus who said, love your enemy, turn the other cheek. And we have Muhammad out here basically raging war on people for political purposes. Um, it's not the same fruit. And we know that the Quran wasn't actually written until... 200 or roughly 200 years after Muhammad died and the Hadith there's just so much that just speaks out against his character now there's a lot that people overlook and this is what I had to pull up just to make sure that I had the full list but I don't really think I have the time to go through the full list that's why I want you to email me but it's the correlations that the Islamic faith has with paganism because the god worshipped Allah is actually an Arabian tribal pagan god. And there's such a correlation between paganism, the paganism that reached out through modern Babylon and part of these Eastern mythicism that were just rebranded and into um, the Islamic faith. 
And the thing is with Muhammad, um, I am so sorry. I, I'm just not on a roll tonight. <laughs> but definitely email me about that. I, I, I'm i sorry. I like really stumbled on all my points there. I'm usually much quicker on this. But I think I'm just a little burnout, to be honest. But definitely email well, me. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later, too. Because when I go into the whole Noahide issue, the Noahide law issue, I will touch on some things with, regarding Islam and how... Um, Awesome. Like some things that I think that maybe uh, Muslims should question uh, yeah. regarding uh, the, the Islam and, and its uh, status under the Noahide laws and why that might be compared to Christianity. So, okay. Um, hopefully, perfect. yeah. So that should that should be, and maybe by then you'll you might have some have yeah, gathered your thoughts I, a little bit more. I'm usually much quicker on this, so I don't know where I dropped the ball. But I want to at least let you know why God became man and what he accomplished for you. Because in the Islamic faith, there is no guarantee of salvation. And what I would just like to say, after seeing all the fruits, um, hopefully you'll come to do your research and see the link between paganism and Islam and kind of how it doesn't match up historically and who Muhammad was as a person, which was just a terrible human being. Um, not a prophet of God, but well, and there's also the doctrine, and I I, um, I would have to look it up. There's a there's basically like a, a loophole that um, you know Muslim clerics have worked out because the Quran um, and the Hadith contradict so much. They actually mm-hmm. came up with a doctrine that's basically like that's okay. They don't have to be consistent at all. They can contradict all they want because Allah can contradict himself all he wants. Basically, like that's pretty pretty bad like that's a pretty you know at least in in the bible we we strive to um to rectify every apparent contradiction um and typically these apparent contradictions are really just the result of somebody that doesn't understand the gospel and doesn't properly divide and once that is worked out there are no contradictions and and but for islam and you know i was um I was, uh, let's say, amenable to Islam long before I was ever amenable to Christianity because I, I very seriously dated um, uh, someone from Somalia, and he was very intelligent. Very, he was a Wilfred Laurier graduate. He taught me a whole lot about the Quran, and, um, you know, and even at the time, he was kind of an atheist because he realized that, uh, well, basically, the first time his family tried to break the fast once they moved from Somalia to Canada— um, however, that's done. Uh, he realized that the, that the the religion could not have been created like the the you know the ritual like the the, the whole uh, time the way that you break the fast that this couldn't have been an omnipotent God that created this because it was very specific to people living in that part of the world. It was very difficult for them to figure out how to do it in uh, in this hemisphere. So so that that caused him great doubt. But he did still teach me a whole lot about Islam, and I, I didn't have like a, a you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not one of the people that just like, I don't have a problem with Muslims or Islam. My only problem now is that I want, I want them to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want them Same. to be safe. And, you know, I have no, like, animosity toward Muslims at all. I love Muslims. I've, I've never actually met a, a Muslim that wasn't very kind and, and awesome. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but I do think that they... You know, I asked my ex, uh, he's, you know, still a dear friend. I asked him, what is what, what was the most life-changing part of the Quran? Could he quote me? A part of the, because he went back to Islam, at, you know, long after we broke up. He, uh, that was his form of godliness. And once he saw the world becoming so godless, that's what he returned to. Um, but he, you know, I, I asked him because he knew I was an atheist when we were together. So for him to see the transformation, because he knew how much I was against Christianity uh, when we were together. So it was very compelling to him to see me um, love Jesus so much. And uh, we had a conversation and I asked him uh, to tell me the most, you know, life changing or uh, his favorite part of the Quran, basically like, you know, what, what is it about Islam that really like the, the most touching, the most, like if you were going to evangelize somebody, you know, in the ways of Muhammad and Allah, Tell me, like, what is that part that just inspires you? He couldn't do it. Bless his heart. He talked me in circles for, like, two hours. And he had to admit later on, like, he didn't have what I have with the Bible. He didn't have that. He didn't have that real, like, that connection where he could really try to to, to, to express to others why they should be Muslim. 
right? Um, and there was no comfort in the Quran. That was the thing, you know, and I've heard other Muslims say this, that there's a, you know, there's, there, there's nothing comforting about, the, about that book and about the God of that book. But if you read the Bible, you know, God, our God is the God of all comfort and love. And, um, you know, and there's no, there's no uh, silly doctrines that, you know, that, that uh, you have to invent to make up for all these contradictions. You know, I guarantee you, if you understand the, the true gospel, and listen, even if you don't believe, like, oh, no, I don't think that's what the gospel says. Just just approach the Bible from the, the perspective that the gospel is grace through faith alone and eternal security. And then rewards for behavior or loss of rewards for bad behavior. But eternal security through faith alone. Uh, you just approach the Bible from, from that perspective, whether you accept it or not. And you'll see there are no contradictions. The, all, all supposed contradictions. Uh, I you know, especially when it comes to like the teachings and stuff. Now there's other little like technical details and stuff like that, that, that are also explainable, but you know, for the most part, the, the major so-called contradictions in scripture that most people point out are entirely due to a false gospel uh, understanding. So um, I recommend, I recommend that, but that's, that's, you know, my experience with Islam and listen, I was, I, I was uh, perfect. That, that was the first time I, I started to appreciate religion. Was 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 just seeing what it you know what it gave people that were Muslim at least that I didn't have as somebody that was that was lost you know and so I just want you to understand I'm not, like I don't have a, a a problem with Islam it's just unfortunate that it's a false god and that they reject Jesus I, I wish it weren't the case right uh, and I and I do believe many will be saved uh, you know especially I think that's why that, that so many are coming into the Western world now. I don't think that's by accident. I think that God intends for that so they can be exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, uh, I think he always, he always had that plan because it's a pretty insular community out there in the Middle East, you know, because Islam is more than just a religion. It's a culture. It's a way of life. It's an identity. And it's not, um, it's not easy for the gospel to penetrate uh, uh, that type of uh, uh, all-encompassing saturation, but when people from that part of the world come to the West, then they have more of a freedom to actually consider Christianity uh, with less reason to fear. And I think that's all part of God's plan. So um, uh, I, you know, so I, I praise God when I see that. Even though some people might think, "Oh no, it's sad. It's a clash of cultures, whatever." I see God's, you know, handiwork in it. I see what His point is. Why, why, why it's happening? Why we're having um, uh, so much immigration from that part of the world, and it is for the sake of of Muslims um, all over the world. I really believe that. So, all right, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you so much for being my crutch. I was stumbling. <laughs> um, but there was one thing that I forgot to say, and you kind of alluded to, is the quote-unquote God, Allah, um, in the Quran, is one of manipulation and deceit. Even, you know, it's said that it was portrayed that Jesus died on the cross, but that was only to deceive the people. And to say that is to say that God uh, deceives. Like I said, my friend, I have plenty more information. Um, it's really hard to break down in just a couple of minutes. And for some reason, my head went blank. So I just want to, um, before I hop into my presentation, I just want to tell you a little bit about um, what it is that Jesus came to do for you, because I have nothing to convert you to. If you became a Christian tonight, it's not like you're going to my church on Sunday or anything. I just want you to, I don't want you to be converted to a religion. I want you to be freed from religion. And that's what Christ offers. He offers a relationship. And Amen. the God of the Bible is not a distant God. It is a very close interpersonal God who has the power to save you and keep you safe through his um, through the very nature of the Godhead. But the reason why God had to become man is, first of all, God is the only, being incarnate can be the only one to live a perfect life and be the only one to raise himself from the dead. So these are going to be two very important things to keep in mind. So, you know, I see that you and Ben are talking a little bit about uh, the law and grace in the chat. So, Basically, under the old covenant, which was to the Israelites, which were to bring forth 
the Messiah that would eventually save the world. We were all bound to the law. The law was the schoolmaster to lead us to Christ and a shadow of good things to come. The law was never intended to save us. The law just became a mirror so we could see just how wretched of sinners we were. And then when Jesus came to earth, he raised the bar and said, if you're so much angry with another person, you have committed murder. If you so much lust after another person, you have committed adultery. He really took it from, you know, your external acts of righteousness mean nothing. It's your heart that needs changed. And I'm the only one that can change your heart. So God, despite how wretched of sinners we are, despite how much we had turned our back from him, rebelled. He became man to live a perfect and sinless life, fulfilling that law to a T that we would never be able to do. And in doing so, he was able to become the perfect sacrifice that had been prophesied for over 1,500 years. And the last prophecy was written 500 years before Jesus Christ's birth. So... When he died on the cross, it's not just like he died. I think people really forget how much he suffered to the point where he was spat on, beaten, mocked by many of the people who were just saying Hosanna a couple days prior. The people who were most faithful to him betrayed him. He was he had a crown of thorns placed on his head. He was forced to carry his own cross. He was nailed to that cross. He was whipped to the point where his flesh was torn from his body. And he did all of that because he loved you. And I think that's very important to remember that he went through all of that before dying on the cross. The reason why is because that moment he died on the cross, he took on the sins of the world. And then three days later, rose from the grave, conquering sin and death. And now all that is required to be saved is to place your trust in Jesus Christ. It's saying, all right, Jesus, I cannot be a perfect person. It's all about you. I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting that you paid it all. Do you notice that every world religion besides Christianity is all about what you can do? That's not a religion that gives God glory. Christianity gives God glory because it's all about what God did for man, a man that had rejected him and turned their back completely. He now offers a plan of salvation through grace by faith alone. And when we place our faith in Jesus, he takes on our sin and we take on his imputed righteousness. We basically do a trade where he takes on our sinful life, we take on his perfect life, and then we will inherit eternal life. We are not doing any of these things because it earns our way to heaven. We are doing it out of gratitude and love for our Father. There's so much evidence out there for the, obviously, I'm not trying to convince you of the existence of God. You believe in God, but just the prophecies leading up to Jesus and the fact that Jesus is the Messiah and the fact that the Messiah is God incarnate. There's so much evidence out there into dismiss all of that to be placed under a pagan worship rebranded in the six to seven hundreds by a man named Muhammad who was nothing but a murderer pedophile tyrant it just doesn't add up to me when we have a god who loves you and will who was willing to come to earth and die for you whereas what was Muhammad willing to do what did he accomplish he did nothing he was just a horrible human being, and the Muslim faith does not promise salvation. It gets you to focus on yourself, focus on your works, which is exactly where the devil wants you so he can get you into hell. That is the Muslim faith, and the Christian faith is one that will say it's not about your works. It's all about the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and through you. So I just pray that you will respond in faith today, and you will at least reach out to me with further questions. I just with um, our two new brothers, uh, they were lifelong Muslims. Uh, Nasir is uh, um, uh, 14 years old, and he actually just got suspended from school a couple of weeks ago uh, for bringing his Bible to school, but he was always allowed to bring his Quran to school. So you have to ask yourself why the world hates the Bible so much and not the Quran. And then uh, his father, when that happened, he actually came to faith in Jesus Christ because he wasn't able to answer that question. So 
I just want to leave you with that. I hope that you will consider it because one will give you a way to eternal life, something that the Islamic faith cannot give you. So, but I am ready to go on my presentation. <laughs> um, as you guys know, I started doing a presentation on the 1800s last week and I broke down the four cults that majorly sprung up out of that time being the Muslim, or I'm sorry, the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses. Um, geez. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Today. Just go back and watch last week's broadcast. It'd be great for Lisa's views. I don't know what's going on with my brain tonight. But the one that I really want to talk about tonight is Christian science. And this isn't to be confused with um, the the fiction writer Scientology uh, religion that we have where you have to buy all these books and everything. This was something that was very specific um, to the early 1800s. It was actually founded by Mary Baker Eddy, who was born in 1821, and she was actually born in New Hampshire. Um, now, basically, and I think this is going to sound really familiar to a lot of people, the whole idea of um, Christian science is basically getting to this point where we realize that everything is just not real. The sickness and illness and sin are not real as well. So I'll dive into that a little bit more. But basically what contributed to that is um, Mary was chronically ill growing up and her husband actually died from yellow fever only six months after they got married. So she was very against illness. I mean, as we all are, but, you know, she had a very specific hatred for it and was looking for outs, um, being that she was raised uh, with the Christian faith. And so in 1859, she actually met a mental healer. Now, hypnotists were very popular at this time. Um, this this man, his name was Phineas. And basically what happened was she merged these new thought teachings that she got from Phineas Quimby. And with her own Christianity, she wrote science and health with the key of scriptures. And basically the whole idea is since God is all good and the only one who exists, things like sickness and death are illusions or mortal errors. And the other thing is, um, they believe Jesus' mission was come was to come and set people free from this uh, lack of knowledge. So anyone who has heard me before or is familiar with themselves, you can tell that this already sounds very much like a rebranding of first century Gnosticism, which is what books like First John and Colossians were up against. Those who aren't familiar with the Gnostics, just a brief rundown. They believe that humans are divine souls trapped in a material world uh, that were created by an imperfect God. They also believe that everything spiritual is holy while everything material is evil or delusional. And in order to be saved, man must be freed from his belief in the material world. And this secret knowledge is what brings freedom. So you can see that there is um, this correlation between Gnosticism and Christian science, which is why I say that uh, this is only one of the reasons why I say Gnosticism has not gone away. Now, when it comes to the numbers today, um, there are less than 100,000 people in over 60 countries of Christian science. So it's not as prevalent um, in terms of having the name Christian science, but it was the fastest growing religion in 1936. My, I don't agree with this point because I think... First of all, 1936 to now, that is a really rapid pace to have a decline in faith. I think it has just rebranded itself into other things, such as the prosperity gospel. There's a huge correlation between the name it, claim it theology. Um, so in my opinion, it's actually one of the largest um, 
Christian denomini or not Christian denominations, but just heretical groups. Um, I've also, as you guys know, I think I brought it up a couple of weeks ago. I personally, when I'm diving into their theology, I'm seeing that some of their theology is making it its rounds in modern secular therapy as well. It's this whole thoughts overcome obstacles. Um, we can create the reality we want in our own mind. So um, that that's to give you guys a basic idea of what they are essentially saying. I'm trying to bring up their tenets here because I actually have these pulled up. But basically, if you guys know what the, uh, sorry, what the prosperity gospel says, you'll see that it's very similar to the Christian science when they say that if your faith is not strong enough, that is why you're seeing sickness. But where they um, take it to the next level is that they just say everything in this world is an illusion. And we'll see that here in their tenets. But it's the Christian scientists that you actually see a lot of these court cases against when there were children who could have been easily healed from something, but they refuse treatment because their whole idea is by seeking treatment for their children, they are just buying into the illusion. So this is straight from their website, The Six Tenets. They say, as adherents of truth, we take the inspired word of the Bible as our sufficient guide to eternal life. Now, that doesn't sound too bad on the surface. That sounds like um, regular Christian lingo. But the thing is, they say, sufficient. And what they mean by that, and it's very subtle, is this isn't the only book we should go by. There are multiple books we should go by. So the Bible is a good book, but it's not the ultimate book. Uh, their second tenet is we acknowledge and adore one supreme infinite God. We acknowledge his son, one Christ, the Holy Ghost, or divine comforter, a man in God's image and likeness. So again, we read this and we're like, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. That sounds just like the Godhead. But that's actually not what they're saying at all. Um, when it comes to, let me see here. I have it written down somewhere. The They actually do not believe in the Godhead. And in terms of their Godhead, they see God as a concept, not a being. And so they say, and this is straight from her book on page 256, it says, life, truth, and love constitute the triune person called God. So it's life, truth, and love that make up God. So this is tricky language that um, would give a Christian adhere the idea that they do believe in the divinity and um, the divinity of the Godhead. Um, sorry, I'm just, I have no idea what's going on tonight, I'm sorry, <laughs> but, um, point three, we acknowledge God's forgiveness of sin in the destruction of sin in the spiritual understanding that casts out evil as unreal, but the belief in sin is punished so long as the belief lasts. So basically, you are only in sin as long as you believe sin is real, and that's the cycle that needs to be broken. We acknowledge Jesus' atonement as the evidence of a divine. This is just word salad right here. <laughs> we acknowledge Jesus' atonement as the evidence of divine, officious love, unfolding man's unity with God through Christ Jesus, the way shower. And we acknowledge that a man is saved through Christ, through life, or through truth, life, and love as demonstrated by the Galilean prophet. So right there, they're calling Jesus a prophet. They don't believe that he is God incarnate in the healing of the sick and overcoming the sin and death. So basically, they believe Jesus' whole ministry was to come as a man, and he was not divine. He was just here to show that one is healed, um, and he was showing them how to overcome sickness, death, and sin. And actually, uh, this lady even went as far to say that the blood that Jesus shed on the cross was no different than the blood that was in his veins. So he never died as an atonement for sin, is what the Christian science will say. Um, we, 
We acknowledge that the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection serve to uplift faith, to understand eternal life, even the allness of the soul, spirit, and nothing of the matter. I kind of just alluded to that. Um, but basically, the resurrection was, or the death and resurrection was to show, yes, God does indeed love you, but um, they don't believe in any particular atonement made by Jesus Christ. And the last point is, as we solemnly promise to watch and pray for the mind to be in us, we also in Christ Jesus do unto others as we have them unto us and be merciful and pure. Now, this was something that I found very interesting. Um, they have, I'm trying to pull it up here. Um, they have what's called a Christian science practitioner, and you can actually locate the ones in your area. And the one who is closest to me is actually about three hours from me. So, um, but these are people who basically... Um, well, let me just read it straight here from their site. Whether you're having a difficulty with a relationship, a chronic or acute illness, a financial burden, an ethical dilemma, a lack of purpose or worth, or any other problem, there are healing answers through prayer. Christian science practitioners know in their hearts and from their experience that, and then they'll quote Matthew 19, 26, with, all, with God, all things are possible. So they take a little phrase from the Bible to make it match their theology while ignoring the rest of the context. Um, when it comes to being addressed, uh, whether or not they are Gnostic, because I guess this is a pretty popular claim to get that in uh, Brahmanism, which I'm not too familiar with Brahmanism. I just know that it's linked to Hinduism. But this is something that they also say. Christian science is not Gnosticism, Gnosticism nor Brahmanism, as is claimed, but it is a restatement or rediscovery of the primitive Christianity. Now, that's the same theme that we see in the last four cults that we looked at last week. The claim that the Christian science to be a reinstatement of the theory and practice of Jesus and the early Christians, it's substantiated by the fact that it is doing the works which Jesus said should be the evidence of true discipleship. Christian science does not teach the disease is healed by denying the existence of the body, but on the contrary teaches that the disease is healed by the understanding of what the mind really is. So, saying the same thing. <laughs> it teaches its students to wipe out the abnormalities and discords of mortal existence by understanding more of the immortal and harmonious reality of being. So that was the last one that I didn't really have a chance to touch on last week. Um, and I felt like it didn't really fit in the family of the other ones we were talking about. But as, um, we continue to talk about the 1800s in the future, I feel like that's going to be something very important to uh, keep in mind. Yeah, I uh, I find it's funny because like I, my ex was, he was drawn, he was seemingly attracted to Christian cults for some reason. Um, and he would always like go back, he would go between Christian science and Unitar Universalist Unitarian. I did not ever go to the uh, mm. Christian Science Church, but the Universalist Unitarian Church we went to was so creepy. It was in a funeral home. And I'm telling you, they were all CIA. They were all CIA. And I walked in there mm. pregnant and their eyes lit up. It was so creepy. I'm not even kidding you. Like it was like they, they, they you know, weren't. I guess because outsiders from you just walk in there. It was a very small group, and I found out that actually they use like you know CIA uses that them as a as a front a lot, but it's very Luciferian, and um and I, I, I it's not quite like the others you've covered, but I find it interesting anyway because there's a whole lot of the same tenets in uh in the UU Church as uh, as you know some of the other things we've covered. So, uh, but yeah, okay. he would he would go back and forth between them, and you know. Well, you know, recently, you know, not too long ago, I went back and warned him, like, stay away from those people, stay away, <laughs> and don't take your children, for the love of God, don't take your children to those places, but, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, very, very creepy. 
creepy stuff. And yeah, uh, okay, it, guys, <laughs> we, we're coming up. We're we're already overdue for a break here. So, Jordan, did you finish everything you wanted to say? I was on mute. I meant to come in when you were done. Uh, I tried to, but my my mic was on mute. Uh, I don't want you to feel rush. Did you finish everything that you needed to say? Because we can come back to it a little bit after the break. I did. Okay, good. I know you you got to the end, but I just want to make sure you didn't skip some things or leave, uh, leave anything out that you wanted to say because we can come back to you. Okay, so um, after the break, we're going to start with Sister Angel's topic for this evening. I think she has a very oh, I, oh, interesting. Okay, we're not going to do Ben's topic? Yeah, we're going to do Ben's topic, too. Okay, okay, okay. Um, okay yeah. I was if he saying. wants to, Ben actually asked me if he could have a little more time. So, Ben, okay. did you want to take advantage yeah, of that? A, did you want to go ahead? I could do either way. So, it's up, totally up to you guys. Um, okay. Uh, well, I, I, so. No problem. We, we, we'll figure it all out <laughs> in the middle of the break then, and we'll come back. Angel, what's your topic again? So what would you like to tell everybody? Yes, it is. Um, well, basically, uh, talking about the Noahide laws and the attack on the Trinity and the divinity of Jesus and the propaganda I'm noticing um, sneaking in through uh, sources. A lot of uh, Christians trust. Suddenly, they'll come out and uh, and and rant against the Trinity and and uh, anyway, I want to tie some things together because uh, I'm noticing it more and more, and I want to explain. Okay. Uh, how the Noahide laws factor into all this, um, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I have to I have to get a little a few more groceries out of the car, so uh, okay. that's why I was yeah I, yeah I, no I problem died while while uh, uh, while yeah while I was trying, so I had to come back oh, in and plug hey. in. I didn't know my phone was uh, was was dead. <laughs> So. Okay, Angel. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Go do your thing. When we come back after the break, what I'll do is give you a little more time, and we'll let Ben talk because Ben never earns his keep, and we're gonna have to make him earn his keep tonight. Uh, I actually have an invoice in here, Ben, this due, and you owe me quite a bit of, of minutes here. So we'll come back after the break, and we'll let Ben uh, share uh, his uh, information about Exodus 5 and the correlations between that and Christ. So he said he was ready to go, so I'm going to go ahead and let him start so we can give Sister Angel a little more time. We'll be back on the other side of the break right here on Late Night with Lisa and friends. So I hope you will stay with us. Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God. In the mighty name of King Jesus, thank you for joining us on the backside of the break here on Late Night with Lisa and friends. We just had some wonderful different subjects that we've covered. We had a lot of fun with some trivia, and I got to rib my friends here a little bit. And we had to uh, make sure that we don't let Jordan have access to a keyboard the next time we do trivia, but we'll get that worked out. And then Ben is going to begin now to elucidate some things uh, that he sees as parallels between Exodus chapter 5 and is it the life of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, Ben? All of the, these things? Um, I, th I think it's uh, inform it helps to inform and provide context for interpretation in a lot of the things that Jesus encountered and and are recorded in the in the four gospels. So I think uh, there's some very I, I call it uh, in part in it, it pun intended. Uh, I call it striking parallels pun intended with Exodus five and the quote unquote hard sayings of Jesus in the four gospels. Okay. All right, then take it away, Ben. Okay. Um, so let me just pull this up here one moment. Okay. So on the screen here, I have Exodus uh, 5, and I'm just going to kind of go through this real quick and, and to see if you can pick out as many parallels uh, as I did, at least initially. Um, I thought this was very just stunning actually and I don't think it's at all a mistake and I'm surprised I've never I've not seen that it would really make this correlation so um I, I'm just surprised because it, to me it's like very uh clear and so this is Exodus 5 
And it says, afterward, Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh. Uh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. And immediately, if you think of, think of a parallel here, you know, Israel or Egypt was uh, called in the Old Testament uh, a house of bondage. And uh, I think it's in Galatians that Paul also calls Israel a house of bondage. Again, Israel uh, was a house of really uh, physical bondage for the Israelites. But I'm sorry, Egypt was. But Israel was a, um, a picture of spiritual bondage under the law for the Israelites. And so I don't think it, it, it makes sense that there would be coincidences here. And it says, if you think of, for example, a lot of the things that the hard saying, so to speak, that people try to say uh, that they try to, you know, they they put in believers' faith, uh, you know, they th they'll throw it at a believer like a like a theological hand grenade, like, oh no, you got to deny yourself and you got to do this and that and all these hard sayings of Jesus. Um, I think most of those things are were his. Um, it's almost like it's, it's pre-evangelization. And I think he's trying to bring their, you know, if they had eyes to see and ears to hear, they would should recognize these parallels that that, that were uh, made in Exodus 5. That Again, they should have been very familiar with. And so, again, Israel was a house of, or Israel in Egypt was a house of bondage. Egypt is referred to as a house of bondage. And Israel, under the law, is a house of bondage. And Pharaoh was the king under the, um, uh, uh, under under the uh, as sorry, Pharaoh was king to the Israelites in Egypt, and uh, Christ in his hard saying, so to speak, his things that he said, like you know, for example, you know, take that lazy and slothful servant, and he'll be beat with uh, many stripes, etc. He's treating the Israelites as slaves because they are they're slaves to the law. They're a slave to sin because they refuse to come to Christ. Uh, to, so that they may be freed from the law. So he's act he's acting to them like Pharaoh did. A merciless the law is merciless, and so he's acting uh, to them. Uh, he's talking to the Israelites. Jesus is uh, many of the things he was saying. You got again keep an eye keep in remembrance who is he talking to? Believers or unbelievers? And uh, many of those hard sayings, so to speak, he's speaking to unbelievers. Um, so um, again. A, a, a parallel again think of christ as pharaoh almost you know a, again a merciful or mer merciless uh taskmaster you can never you know the works of the law you you can never satisfy the works of the law and that's why a lot a lot of things um under the law you'll see like a, a lot of key phrases are used under the law for example um like idle so if you're idle um you know, Paul. Paul says uh, uh, in Second Timothy that he talks when he's talking about Judaizers, he refers to them as idle talkers. You see that word "idle" a lot, and that's a key word. Why is that? Why are they idle? Because again, they're talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. The, you're, you're idle when uh, you're you're being judged by the law because you can never satisfy the unrelenting demands of the law. The the, the law is a a tyrant. Uh, and so again, so afterwards, Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh. He says, thus says the Lord of God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Um, so right there, a couple of interesting parallels, you know, um, Israel, uh, they essentially, they are uh, likened to, to being in the wilderness. Uh, obviously, when they were, um, when they're escaping, that when they failed to enter the promised land, which is a picture of Christ, because they entered that promised land, they were uh, caught out into the wilderness. And they wanted to hold the feast. Are, are they? Well, let me, let me continue on here. So, and Pharaoh said, "Who is the Lord that I shall obey His voice and let Israel go?" Well, again, think of Pharaoh in some respects uh, as both a, as a picture of Christ, but also the Pharisees. The Pharisees did not obey Christ's voice. They they did not know the Lord. He says, "I do not know the Lord, nor will let will I let Israel go." That's exactly how the Israelite or the Pharisees were. They they as the national leaders, they did not know God, and that's why they, they didn't recognize Christ, and they would not let Israel go. In, in that respect, they would not let people uh, be freed from the law. They accused Christ of, of leading Israel astray, um, and then uh, and then uh, so. So if you read, I actually don't want to take too much time because I, I could go really through this verse by verse. But the things that's interesting is that um, 
you know, the common themes that you see throughout Exodus 5, I recommend that you uh, re read it very carefully. But some of the things that uh, the striking parallels, uh, so to speak, that I found um, is that whenever you read, it, it, it reads, uh, 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 Exodus 5 talks about how Pharaoh appointed over the people um, officers and taskmasters. And the taskmasters and the officers would be the ones that were beating the Israelites and, and placing on them a greater demands. Uh, you know, saying you have not met your quota again. Uh, that's law language. You can never meet your quota under the law. They doubled. They and then the officers, the taskmasters, actually doubled the quota. Um, and then in the in the sense that they said, okay, we're not. You're not even going to give you straw anymore. You have to get your own straw. And when they when they had to go grab their own straw, they were scattered across the land to retrieve that straw. And again, Christ said, if you don't gather, he who doesn't gather with me is scattered abroad. Um, and again, that's not a coincidence. And if you think of the uh, officers and taskmasters in Exodus 5 as the scribes and Pharisees, that is, uh, again, I, I, I'm certain that's not a mistake. Um, you know, the, you see a common group of, of phrases. So, for example, in Exodus 5, you see the word servant or slave, lazy, idle. And that's exactly what Christ said, you know, to the uh, in, the, in his parable of the... Um, I think it's the unforgiving servant or unprofitable servant. He says, take that servant, that lazy and slothful servant, and, uh, you know, cut. he'll be cut in two. And that also, that word cut in two also tells you that's law language because under the law, that's why they would sacrifice animals as an indication, basically saying, hey, if either of us break our terms of the covenant, this is what, uh, this is what we deserve or this is what's we're cursed, essentially. We're going to be cut. Just like the animals cut in two in multiple pieces, we're going to be cut in two. And again, I, I think these are very important things to keep in mind when you're interpreting, because a lot of people don't take these, these obvious parallels uh, into their interpretation. They say, oh, no, see, this is talking. In fact, even Grace Evangelical Society, who are free gracers, they read those verses, uh, those hard sayings of Jesus, so to speak, talk about being beaten with many stripes, uh, being cut in two. He, they, they interpret those verses uh, again, they're champions of grace, great champions of grace, but yet they err when they read these verses and say, no, that these these verses are, are applicable to uh, uh, unfaithful believers who will be cast into outer darkness, which they don't see as a picture of hell, but just as a place of, of uh, dishonor, essentially, uh, uh, which, again, I would absolutely refute. I believe wholeheartedly, without a doubt, that outer darkness is uh, a picture of hell. Um and so, again, you see a common grouping of words. You see servant, lazy, idle, strike and beat, um, scatter or not gather, uh, given or taken. So, you know, Christ said, for example, uh, you know, that the, the the straw was not was taken away from the Israelites in, in Egypt and, it, and they had to gra gather, gather it themselves. And, then, you know, Christ said, you know, uh, uh, he who has uh, even what he has will be taken from him. Uh, there's the idea of work and labor, stone and brick, officers and taskmasters, Pharisees and teachers of the law. Um, and again, you know, if Egypt is a picture of the world, which I believe it is essentially, and everyone's bondage to sin, then the servant uh, in Luke that he refers to as uh, being a, a, a worthless and unprofitable servant, he has to be a slave under the law who had never been freed from the law of sin and death. Because it says in Corinthians, for example, 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the, st the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. And so that's why, you know, for us not to die uh, eternally, we need to be freed from the, the from law because the law, the strength of sin is a law where there's no law. There's no offense. And that's why when Jesus um, said he with the, he who with, is without sin cast the first stone, that whole uh, episode in John was showing or a demonstration of, of Jesus having the power to disperse the witness or uh, 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 defang the, the witness, if you will. So again, the law required two or three witnesses. So he was showing that um, he has the power to, to take away the witness against us, which is the law. Um, and he said, he said, John 8, 36. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And he's talking about freedom from the law, freedom from the bondage of sin. Um, and so, again, in Luke 12, 47, for example, there's a verse, again, many people interpret this as a warning to a believer. And 
And it, it's when Luke 12, 47, it says, And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. And again, that's that's law language. You're you're under the law if you're beaten. The law <laughs> requires punishment. It shows, you know, again, Christ is, is acting like Pharaoh, essentially. Just like Pharaoh and the uh, the officers and taskmasters, they beat the Israelites because um, they were not working hard enough. So again, it's it's clear indication that those he's talking to someone who's under the law. Uh, there's another verse that says, uh, you know, that a son, that a a slave does not live in the house forever, but a son a son abides forever. So you need to be become a son, not a slave. Um, let's see what else I have here. Oh, uh, also too is that you know the the. Um, the in Exodus five you know, again they they uh, kept an, uh, increasing their quota of bricks and made it harder for them to meet their their quota and that's exactly what the uh, uh, pharaohs were doing uh, that's where Christ said in Matthew twenty three verse four he says talking of the Pharisees he says for they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders but they themselves will not move move them with one of their fingers. So again, they put burdens on other people that they themselves do not keep, nor they, do they even attempt to help these people uh, with these uh, with these burdens. Um, mm-hmm. And then also too, in Exodus five verses four through five, it says, "Then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor." And Pharaoh said, "Look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor." I mean, it's a clear parallel that of Christ during his ministry. That's what exactly what the tri- uh, scribes and Pharisees were saying. Uh, you know, basically, hey, don't listen to Christ. Get back to your work. Get back to the, your observance of the law. Uh, he's trying to, you know, don't listen to him. He wants you, he, you know, you want, he's asking you to rest from your labor. And that, no, you get back to work. Um, and that's why Christ said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all, who, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Um uh, and and that's where that's 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 how you identify every false religion. Every false religion doesn't ha, has one thing in common: it's works and it, it's it's self merit, uh, not grace. There, no no religion in the world relies a hundred percent on God's grace. Only uh, Christianity has that, and and that's why every religion, whether it be Freemason, Freemasonry, Islam, Mormonism, they all have an element of work or merit. And because they are, try- you're trying to build, you're basically trying to build yourself a way to heaven. And that's why Acts 4.11 says, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. So people do not rest in the finished work of Christ and his, his perfect foundation that he laid for us. People will not come to him. Uh, but what they want to do is, is offer God something with their filthy, with their filthy hands and sinful hands and filthy rags. Um, in fact, that's why they said the old, even in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, uh, Islam is without an excuse because again, they 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 hold the Old Testament, and all throughout the Old Testament, it shows uh, every page that they say uh, refutes Christ. Christ is on every page. Uh, that's why they couldn't build their altars with with instruments made by hands. Again, because a man, anything that man touches is defiled. Um, so uh, also too in, in Exodus five six through nine it says so the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying you shall no longer give again that's a grace principle you don't don't give uh, you should no longer give people straw to make brick as before let them go and gather straw for themselves and they shall and they shall lay on them the quarter of bricks which they made before you shall not reduce it for they are idle. Therefore, they cry out, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let us let more work be laid on the men that they may labor in it and let them not regard false words. So, again, the scribes and Pharisees were saying in, they said that Jesus uh, words were false. They're saying that the, his apostles uh, words were false. And again, they they wanted to sacrifice to their God. They wanted to sacrifice to God and they didn't want it. They didn't want to accept. God sacrificed for them. They wanted to sacrifice to God. And that's really what Hebrews is all about, is that they, these were believers who were being uh, persecuted and becoming dull of hearing and slowly drifting away from the Lord in unbelief. And that's what that whole, it's a whole warning and an admonishment to these believers. Do not 
let that happen to you. Not that you'll lose eternal life, but you will be you'll you'll you will uh, face uh, temporal judgment um, and be numbered with the people um, who are the um, adversaries who was the Christ rejecting nation of Israel. And I believe AD 70 is in view there. Um, but again, again, rather than receiving their their Christ sacrifice and abiding and continuing in it and trusting in it and, and moving on and pressing on to maturity and faith, they are being uh, lured back to the law, which again, sacrifices to God, whereas God make our man, he sacrificed for us. Um, so I, again, I could go on and on, and if you need more time, Angel, I could <laughs> go on. But there's all kinds of parallels in Exodus 5 to Christ's ministry, um, and I think it's super fascinating. So many parallels yeah. that, uh, uh, again, I, yeah, so uh, I could go into more. No, I mean, I, I, it's funny because it sets it up perfectly, too, because it's really okay. all the same thing. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just saying because, you know, it's, 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 it's true. You can't work. You can never work hard enough if work is the standard. And I don't know what's so hard about that, like why people can't get that. If, it, you know, <laughs> you cannot possibly, if you have to work for immortality, there is never, you could never do enough. You could never do enough work because you could never do enough work to catch up with the deficit you're already at when you'd already sinned. And, you know, before you realize that you need to start working for your salvation, you are already, you're already damned. Because you are already imperfect, so right. I think that's just a really great illustration of that. And plus, you know, it, it, when you said that to me the other night, it totally explained the idea of the idle shepherd. Because it always was, I was like, why would you yes. describe as the idle shepherd? You yes. know, the Antichrist. And so this totally makes sense because he's going to, uh, you know, uh, he's going to basically promote, you know, a uh, works based uh, type of of message. Um, you know, re return people to that bondage and. Um, you know, I, I, th I think, I don't know if people really heard you and you said you can, you, you know, you're, it, you're, you're idle if you're working for your salvation, no matter how hard you're working, because you're not working hard enough. So, right. If you look yeah. at the Old Testament, if you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, look at every word for idle. Um, and it's always in re reference in the, if in the context to someone under the law, because again, you're under grace, you're not judged by your works. There's, there's nothing to be idle for, you know, there, there, there's no, there's no stipulations upon you other than faith. That's the you're the, under the law of faith, and but the law of works is uh, you you are always idle because you can never meet the demand. You can never satisfy that quota, um, it, because and it God doesn't even. Uh, well, first of all, I guess I guess all six hundred thirteen laws would be the quota, but the quota is it's uh, insurmountable. You can't do it. No one can ever do it. And like, mm -hmm. like uh, you said, Angel, and like uh, Lisa has an awesome meme on. Uh, you, you, it's not Matt, even if you could meet the quota, you can't. You can't get your sin back to zero, and that's what it requires. Yeah. So you, you're condemned for sin. Even if you lived a perfect life from right this moment on to your death, you can't. You can't fix what you've already done. You've already sinned, and you. God requires payment for that sin. So in mm -hmm. thought, word, and deed. That's the thing. Right. Like, like I, I don't know. People think that it's just what they, what they. Um, actually do externally but no J jesus makes that so clear it you know the standard that he set i mean I, it amazes me that some people think that they can live up to that that if you that it, you know if you, mm -hmm. you 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 hate another man you've committed murder in your heart like don't don't they understand it's it's in your very the very thoughts that go through your mind the thoughts of your heart that's why you know i always uh I love when David prays that, you know, that the thoughts of his heart be pleasing to God, because I know that feeling because that is that's something that's so important to me, you know, and I know mm -hmm. that that's really where God's looking and he's not looking at it for salvation either. It's just for mm -hmm. the fellowship with him. And, um, you know, uh, I believe, you know, people also don't understand the idea of rewards and, and, and lost rewards in terms of etern the eternal sense. I mean, it's, it, uh, so many people don't even factor that in at all. And when you try to explain it to them you know, because they want, they demand to know what penalty these other people, because they're never talking about themselves. It's always right. other people. They, you know, uh, Owen Benjamin's uh, fans like to call them churchians. That's what they call them. Churchians that they claim that we only talk about faith alone because we're not doing anything right. Um, that, that <laughs> they, uh, they demand to know what the point is of, of even, uh, abstaining from sin or trying to, 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 to behave well. And they, 
the, the, the notion of eternal awards just goes totally over their head. And then when you point it out to them, it's not good enough. It's simply not good enough for them that there are rewards in eternity for those who actually do the will of God and those, and, the, and those who, who fail to, 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 to rise to that occasion um, to, you know, to whatever extent, I mean, it's not exactly clear, uh, but they will be, they will lose out on those potential rewards. And somehow that's not good enough uh, for people because it has to be about their salvation. They have to think they're earning their salvation. It's like a pathological need in the human spirit. Uh, it's, well, in any other situation, rewards would be fine. That would be plenty. But when it comes to salvation, they need to think they're working for their salvation. Well, that, I'd like to point to something going all the way. And Ben, that was most excellent, by the way. I'm going to go back and listen to it again because I was uh, reading and helping out in the chat. But I wanted to point out that right there at the fall, then, and, and a lot of people just miss this, especially all the works righteous heretics. Okay, uh, right there at the fall, when man realizes he's naked, he goes and he fashions for himself. The Bible says an apron made of fig leaves to cover his nakedness, and it's not suitable. His own works, his own measure, what he came up with to cover his nakedness. To cover his mistake, he knew something was wrong. He didn't know how to fix it. I'm going to try to fix this myself. And God comes and says, Adam, where are you? He said, well, I hid myself because I knew I was naked. He said, who told you were naked? And then God, after as Angel pointed out, he blames, <laughs> he blames the woman and God. The woman that you gave me, gave me of the tree to eat, and I did eat. But then God, the Bible says, he slew an animal and he took the skins from that animal and covered them. And this is where we see atonement. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. This is where the concept comes from, right there at the foot of the fall. If you fast forward to the life of Christ and all the attestations all through the old covenant of the coming Messiah. In Psalms 22 and Isaiah 53. And what's going to happen to Jesus? Already prophesied. Already had the expectation that he's going to the cross. Behold the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And then Hebrews 8 so clearly explains that there is now therefore no more sacrifice. Jesus is it. And if somebody tries to do anything else but receive Christ, they remain under judgment. In uh, John 3.36, Jesus said, uh, well, John is speaking there, and he says, He that hath the Son hath everlasting life. He that hath not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The only acceptable sacrifice is what the Lord Jesus did. Full and complete payment. Full and complete pardon. Through faith in his name. Through faith in his work. Through faith what he's done in his life, death, burial, and resurrection. Anything else is unacceptable. And the Bible makes it clear in Hebrews that Jesus does not atone our sin. See, it explains that the atonement was from year to year, that the high priest had to enter once a year, not without blood, for, to offer this sacrifice for not only himself, but for the sins of the people. And the Bible goes on to say that Jesus is not atoning. It's a once and for all complete payment. So it's not atonement because atonement had to be done every year. That's why Jesus, he didn't say, I've atoned for you on the cross when he said to tell us die. He said, it is finished. I believe atonement Paid. means covering. It means covering, not taking away. It just means to cover temporarily. Exactly. And that's what Hebrews explains. That is temporary for atonement under the law. And this is why Hebrews is warning if these people return to law keeping, they have no sacrifice. Because the only sacrifice that is acceptable is what Jesus himself has done. 
And these self-righteous heretics do not see this. There's something about the fallen man that loves its rituals and loves its works. And this is why you see Jesus say that many shall say unto me in that day. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name do many wonderful works? It's all about their works. And the first thing he says, not that you were saved lost because you sinned too much and you all sin my grace. The first thing he says is, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He's telling them all those works were actually iniquity. You know why? Because they were denial of his name. They were denial of his payment. They were denial of his soul sufficiency. And every false way relies on what they can do themselves and not what Jesus has done. And they think they're mocking us. Oh, you greasy grace believers. Oh, you once saved, always saved. They're not mocking us. They are mocking the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible talks about those that mock even the, the, the one that bought them, that, that paid for them. That's what they're doing. So it's clear people want to play games with the scripture because they want to make it bend to fit their paradigm, their doctrine, their denomination. That's not how it works. The Bible defines itself. And we're supposed to get into the scripture and see what Jesus, the scripture is talking about, because the world has a Jesus. They even got a transgender Jesus. They got all these other things. That's not the Christ. That's not who Jesus is. The only way you can know who Jesus is is to get in this Bible and see what it says for itself rightly dividing the word of truth, looking at scripture in context compared to who he's talking to and what's being said and what's going on, and then properly deciding based upon the scripture who the real Jesus is. The world don't have it. These fake faux churches don't have it because only Jesus saved, saves, not your filthy rags works, not one work, not one at all. And we see this when Paul rebuked Peter to his face because he was uh, running with the Judaizers and he, and he started believing and even teaching that they had to add circumcision. And Paul rebuked him to his face to be, because he said he was to be blamed. You know why? Because other people started believing it and doing it too and expecting it for the Gentiles. And the Lord laid out a sheet, showed him a vision, Peter, with all these different creeping things. And I imagine they were probably shellfish and maybe some swine and some other stuff that the Jews didn't eat. And he stretched it out and he told him three times, take, kill, and eat. And he said, not so, Lord, for no unclean thing has passed my lips. And Jesus said, what I have made clean, don't you dare call unholy. And that's when he came to understand that the Gentiles were received through faith in Christ without one work. Just like the Hebrews. It's right here in the Bible, but people play like they don't see it. And it's sad because the Bible says no man can come unless the Holy Spirit draw him. And that people remain in darkness because they love darkness rather than light. And the Bible talks about there is a light that is darkness. And the Bible says if you have that light, how great is your darkness? So that's why when, I, when we admonish people, make sure, like Paul, examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Make sure you have the right gospel according to the scripture because there are so many false ways Jesus warned about it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Straight is the gate. People want to make that about works. Jesus is saying he's the narrow way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. He didn't say no man comes in except they do all these works. But that's exactly what people look at that passage and think he's talking about.
because they're all wrapped up in works. It's the most sad and tragic thing. The only sin a person is going to hell for is the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his soul sufficiency and his finished work. And then because they didn't believe, he said, if, if you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. And that's what happens. They die in their sins and their sins remain. So if they were a whoremonger, an idolater, a blasphemer, a homosexual, or all of the above, their sin remains because they were never washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's the most tragic thing ever. Okay, I think I pressed enough. I, I want to address a couple of things that you don't mind real yeah. quick in the chat that people are bringing up about what I talked about. Um, they're saying, you know, what, what does idol mean in Matthew 12? What, what did Jesus mean by your, by your words? You'll be justified and your words. You'll be condemned. The context there is again, uh, it, again, it, well, the, the Matthew 12 provides a fair amount of context, but there's verses or chapters leading up to that. And basically you'll see it that Jesus is pounding the drum over and over again to these self-righteous Pharisees that they're actually hypocrites because they don't, they don't actually do what they say. Um, and not only is their doctrine hypocritical, but their works are hypocritical. And uh, that's where the, and, and he also says in the context that uh, by, through the, uh, by the abundance, through, through the abundance of the heart, uh, what the heart treasures, the mouth speaks. So what he's saying there, whatever they're saying is they're, they're speaking from their heart, their authority. And actually the word heart in Hebrew means authority. And that's why, you know, when you accept Christ as, uh, king essentially in your heart he's the kingdom the kingdom of god is your heart essentially you're the temple of god because your heart he you made him king in your heart you accepted his grace and um and yet these pharisees they never let him into it into their heart so their kingdom was their earthly kingdom with their earthly temple in which christ is actually going to physically stand in but again he is in our heart he rules in our rules and reigns in our heart as as the spirit but um, he's going to do it eventually on earth, which you talked about last week. But these Pharisees, through the uh, out of the abundance of the heart, their mouth spoke. And what they were saying was in that same context, it was the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. They said that the, he had an unclean spirit. Um, and he calls them, uh, at, you know, he said, by every idle word that men speak, they will be judged. By your words, you'll be justified and your, ju your words will be, will be condemned. Well, first of all, that that's people under the law. Like I mentioned before, when you receive the word idle in, in the um, Bible or thief, you see thief too, uh, or any keywords, all kinds of keywords the Bible uses. And a lot of people think, oh, can I, are those consistent? Can I consistently apply those to my interpretation? Um, and I, I found uh, that that's one thing I wanted to find out is that, okay, uh, I'm seeing this word idle a lot. Is it consistently under people under the law? I searched that out and absolutely that's the case. Um, same with thief. Christ comes as a thief to people who don't know him because he's going to take their kingdom from them. Uh, but he's in our heart. He's a, he already owns our heart. You know, and we're going to, uh, he, that's our, he's, he's the king of our kingdom. And uh, you think about that kingdom too, is that when, when God created this heaven and earth, he planted seed, he created the earth, which is the kingdom. He planted seed. Uh, th that's vegetation. Uh, he put Adam and Eve in the garden. They were, they were king and queen, so to speak. That, but Satan took that kingship from Adam, and um, and that's why this that's why Antichrist is going to come in. Uh, I believe in the tribulation, enter uh, Ezekiel's temple. Is he's going to say, "I'm king of this world. I'm the god of this world," and then Christ is going to come and say, uh, "Not so fast." Essentially, uh, it's my temple. But again, that that's a visual manifestation of a spiritual reality that's already happened for believers. He, again, Christ is he's the king of our spiritual kingdom, and the, the, the planting that happens, at, the Bible makes clear that all through the Bible that the land or a, a, the plot of land, Israel was a plot of land. And in, in the plot of land, he gave Abraham seed, uh, which is progeny. He, he gave him a Davidic king. Um, but this, again, the seed were the people. Well, in the uh, spiritual kingdom, the, the seed is the word of God. And they, they that's why the, the Israelites rejected, they rejected the word of God. So all they have is this earthly kingdom. Um which is only a type of shadow. Uh, so again, in our hearts, we the, the king, the kingship, or the land of our of the, the the realm of the king is our heart. The 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 seed in our in, in that kingdom is the word of God. It's the parable of the sower, and Christ is king. He's the one that reigns in there. But again, this earth uh, has also its its shadow of, of that, um, where you see plants and animals that are their their uh, seed. You have land 
that was given to Israel, the plot of land that's almost like a, a realm or a heart, if you will. The land is a heart. Um, anyways, uh, the thing I'm saying there is that we receive the word idol. It's referring to people under the law. So when Christ says, by the every word that you speak, you'll be justified. And every word you'll be condemned. Well, he's talking to these unbelievers, Israel. They will be judged by their works. Even your words are works in that respect. And because their heart, that their words will show that their heart was unconverted, that their king was not Christ, that by the words they spoke against him, it's going to show they were unregenerate. They're under the law and they're going to be condemned by the law. They're going to, they're going to die in their sin. Um, so I, again, I think whenever you read, Word, read words like uh, king, I'm sorry, uh, idol. It's I talk about people under the law because you could never satisfy the demands of the law. No matter how busy you are, the law, you're never, the work is never done. You never, there's never, you can never do enough works. Um, and that's why we have let Christ do our work for us. And that's why we rest in him. So, um, you know, God sees two people. There's two races of men in God's eyes. You're in Adam or you're in Christ. Those are the only two races of men. All in Adam die. All, all in Christ live. So choose wisely. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jordan, did you fall asleep on us over there? No, I'm still here. I'm just okay. bringing it all in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I wanted to ask you if you had anything you wanted to add before we go to Sister Angel's topic for this evening. No, I just love listening to Ben talk. <laughs> He's always got so much information. Oh, okay. Just Ben. Okay. Oh, don't Nathan. do that. I, I got to go again. That's two. Hold on. Where's my list here? That's two. Okay. All right. So <laughs> <He's> characterized. <laughs> Sister Angel, are you yes, ready? Yes, hello. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes, I um, I figure I'll give people just a, a quick uh, precursor when it comes to the the Noahide laws, um, we've mentioned them here before. Um, first, I want to uh, say that if you look at public law 102-14, these are a matter of public law in the U.S. Congress signed them into law. Just because they are not being enforced at the moment does not mean they're not already on the books. They are sleeper laws. Uh, Congress has made repeated gestures upholding the validity of the Noahide laws. Uh, several times they have used the Noahide prayer to uh, to begin session. If you there's a there's a website called StopNoahideLaw.com, which is actually run by a a gay Hindu man um, who is sounding the alarm louder than most Christians, uh, trying to warn Christians because also it the Noahide laws do attempt to uh, interfere with Hinduism because um, obviously Hinduism is considered uh, polytheistic, um, uh, but also because he's a gay man. And uh, under these laws, he will be put to death. So um, uh, I find that actually quite interesting because he is, it's, it's kind of amazing to see somebody who's not actually a Christian be so honest about what, about the ramifications of these laws and the way that they specifically target Christianity. He doesn't actually have a, a horse in the race in that regard to, to you know, to, to uphold, I guess, the validity uh, or the goodness of Christianity. Yet he will, he will uh, freely admit that these laws are, um, uh, you know, th th they target specifically Christians. And he, he believes that it's, it's imperative for the Christians to, uh, uh, become aware of this threat in order that, you know, maybe, maybe there will actually, you know, people will manage to put a stop to these things. I don't believe that there's any stopping this train. I think this is all prophecy playing out. Um, and uh, I understand though uh, that a lot of people feel that that's, you know, defeatism or that we're not supposed to just lay down and uh, uh, acquiesce to the, to the plans of the Antichrist. But um, I, you know, to me, it just seems like a, a strange, would be a strange idea to try to stop the fulfillment of prophecy, although I don't support them. And I do think it's very important to <laughs> to sound the alarm and to point out what's really happening, what's going on. Um, one, so that we can explain the ways that uh, the public is being manipulated in advance of these laws, such as with the attacks on the Trinity, which uh, I'll get into but also because um, I think it would wake a lot of people up. Like, why would <laughs> what, it, it, it actually like you know proves the Bible true in so many ways? Because um, under these laws, uh, Christians will be put to death by decapitation. 
right? And so a lot of people can accept the the reality of uh, the threat of of like uh, Zionism and um, the Israel lobby, even though that they reject Christianity. But when they see that this very uh, force that they're so concerned about is especially uh, motivated to destroy Christendom and Christianity, it tends to make them think twice about whether or not uh, Christianity is uh, as bogus as they think. Plus, a lot of these people will also claim that Christianity is like a Jewish deception. It's like the Bible is, you know, written by Jews and it was all a big Jewish, you know, hoax or, 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 or you know, it's all a Jewish mind control, which is very strange considering they want to, you know, uh, put Christians to death ultimately, right? You know, that, that would be, so I, I think there's a lot of, of useful applications for exposing this uh, uh, agenda besides, you know, actually trying to stop it um, because it really does uh, uh, cause people to think um, in many different ways. So I think what I'll do first, just real quickly, is to read over these laws. Um, seven laws of Noah. These are not in the Bible. Um Uh, Nowhere in the Bible (laughs) are seven laws of Noah listed. They claim that these laws were given after the flood, right? And uh, this is all Talmudic stuff, right? So, and keep in mind, they sound pretty innocuous on the surface until you understand the penalty for each and every single one of them. If you were to break any of these laws, the penalty is the same, death by decapitation. And they're mandatory. And they consider these laws mandatory for all Gentiles. And um, the plan is... Uh, and like I said, they already got it on our books uh, as a matter of public law in the U.S. And they're, they have the U.N. has already decreed them. I think it was in 2013 uh, on StopNoahHideLaw.com. It, it, it lists all the pertinent information that you could possibly want to know. I was having a hard time getting some of the pages to load, though. Um, but so so number one, belief in God. Do not worship idols. That's the first law right now. See, that's that that number one law. That's 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 uh aimed at us Christians because they believe that due to um, the, the the doctrine of the Trinity or the Godhead and the fact that Jesus, you know, we 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 uphold him as divine as as uh, God in the flesh that we are idolaters. So um, the penalty, unless we were to renounce that aspect of our faith. Um, and become quote unquote shituf, which is basically Noahide approved form of Christianity or any other religion. Shituf is 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 there is the is a, is a Hebrew word for that. Um, we would be put to death for merely upholding that you know that Christ was God in the flesh and that uh, uh, he was co-equal you know to God to God the Father. That they are you know one and yet separate. Um, they they consider that polytheism, right? So um, to respect God and praise Him. So do not blaspheme His name. And uh, am I there? I'm just making sure you guys can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Not really quite. All right. So here. Um, so do not blaspheme His name. And I'm trying to remember what they call God in. Uh, the Talmud, it's not a, a name we're familiar with. Um, Hashem, that's right, Hashem. So um, the number three is do not murder. <laughs> uh, number four is do not commit immoral sexual acts. That's where the uh, that's where the LGBT will uh, you know meet its end, basically. And I, I truly believe that the whole purpose of all the ridiculous outrageous nonsense we're seeing where they're trying to force all this, this, this craziness on regular people when it comes to the LGBT agenda is, is intentionally designed uh, so that we will accept this law when it comes to pass, because we will have been pushed over the edge. Who's going to come to their defense, right? When you see the radical activists who are insisting that basically that we don't even have a right to keep, you know, grown men out of our little girl's bathroom. If that man, you know, happens to believe that day that he's a woman, um, uh, these things are all by design. This is not what you do when you're trying to actually uh, uh, cultivate acceptance or tolerance in society. This is what you do when you're trying to cultivate a violent backlash. You mess with people's kids. That's what you do if you want people to snap. And that's why they're doing it because um, they're drawing these people out into the open. 
you know, hey, gay pride, right? They're telling you to, 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 to come out loud and proud and not even conceal, you know, your identity. You have no reason to hide. Be proud. Not only be proud, but, but um, be uh, imposing. They even have, like, I think in Tel Aviv right now, it's like the big, or Jerusalem, I think even, they have a gigantic gay pride parade that goes on every year. Now, this is done to actually get the, um, you know, the average everyday Israelis on their side when the time comes by driving them up the wall with this craziness, right? There's a whole lot about their prophecies in the Talmud that play into this. Basically, they, they, they believe that a, that a, that one third of the, of the Jews will have to die in order for their, um, messianic age to begin, basically. They, they're, they're happily ever after. Um, so, in a lot of in a lot of ways they don't even that, that's why a lot of a lot of the things that they're doing right now like the ADL and the SPLC they're kind of um like open about like the, the nonsense that they're pushing they don't mind having people uh grow increasingly frustrated with the Jewish lobby um because part of the plan is to first drive uh, the Jews back to Israel, but greater Israel, because that's why they need to expand their borders uh, per their prophecies. They have to expand their borders to their original size. And then they need people to populate that, that greater Israel, but they also need, um, they need a, a purging, uh, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately that's part of their prophecy. So it almost seems as though part of the plan is to create a, uh, a backlash against the Jews themselves in order to fulfill their prophecies, because that's what they're always doing. They're always trying to, 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 to put the cart before the hearse. They're trying to fulfill their prophecies rather than let God fulfill them. That's, that's like part of the Talmudic uh, uh, standard operating procedure. They're always trying to find different ways to bring these things about. Right. So um, let's see here. Uh, do not steal is number five. Number six, pursue justice. Now, I guarantee you that has some interesting applications because all of these laws have countless sub laws to them and interpretations. And um, much of it is hidden from uh, the uh, Gentile community. Um, they don't make a lot of this stuff very easily accessible. It's difficult to get the um, full translations in English um, because they, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is quite disturbing. But because um, they will uh, try, they'll try to kind of uh, allay your fears by saying that all of these things are only going to happen when their Moshiach arrives. Because, you know, they're counting on the idea that you don't believe their Moshiach is ever going to arrive. So why would you be worried about, uh, about these laws? It's like, you know, a fairy tale, basically. But that's not true. They absolutely, uh, you know, in, in their uh, holy books, uphold the idea that they have to bring these things about in order to bring their Moshiach, uh, you know, to power, right? So we understand their Moshiach to be the Antichrist. Um, now, here's the really interesting and strange one. Number seven, do not eat the flesh of an animal while it is still alive. Do not eat the flesh torn from a living animal. There's something to that. I don't understand why that would be one of the laws. I, I, I shudder to think why that would be one of them. But uh, I don't know who even does that, but uh, food for thought, right? I don't even, I can't, the, the other ones seem relatively self-explanatory, but this one is just really odd. And I, I think there's got to be a specific reason for it. Now, I said all that to say this. Um, recently, I've noticed, well, <laughs> for a while now, uh, a guy named Owen Benjamin, many of you may have heard of him. He's a former Angel. comedian. So, yes. Before you continue on number seven. Yeah. Um, it depends like on how you're looking at it because it says, do not eat the flesh that was removed from a living animal. Initially, when you're looking at it, you're mm. thinking it's something that's alive, but uh, all animals have been alive at one point. It didn't say while it's alive. So are they going to be pushing like vegetarianism and veganism I so you can't even eat so. flesh? They're very specific. They say, um, all right, so this is on a Chabad no Lubavitch website. Uh -huh. So this is the um, what, what's underneath that law. So uh, we are the caretakers of God's creation. Ultimately, our responsibility extends beyond our family, even beyond society, to include the world of nature. Eating meat so fresh that the animal is still alive may be healthy, 
but it is cruel, even barbaric, displaying a decadent insensitivity to the pain of others. The law is the touchstone, if you will, that provides a measure of how well the other six laws are being observed. Make sense of that, if you will. I don't know. I just think that's just such a strange okay. random thing. Who does that? Okay, I mean, so I've that never did. even heard such a thing. People eating the flesh of a living animal, like, a, like cutting a leg off an animal and keeping it alive. While you're, I just, I've never heard of that. I don't know if that's something people do somewhere, but it's very strange that that was something that they they honed in on since I think it's a pretty uncommon practice anyway. So that I think there's no, some no. interesting reason for that. And I, I almost, you know, can't even, I shudder to think what what that reason might be but i have a feeling it's pretty dark um i don't know what they got planned but it just seems a little strange to me so um uh, really what i'm going to be talking about it revolves around law number one of course which is do not worship idols right and um you know owen benjamin is uh you know what i guess you would call him a truther right he's a former semi-famous comedian who like started you know he basically you know, the, his narrative is he gave up his career in Hollywood because he decided to call out the trans kid, kids agenda and he lost his agent and blah, 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 blah. And then he started just ranting on YouTube for a living. And he uh, got banned from several platforms over the past uh, couple of years, basically for be he became known as, a, as like a famous anti-Semite, basically. And um, he was just constantly ranting against the Jews and the Jews and the Jews. Nothing of any use, though, right? Nothing that's actually pertinent or worth complaining about. He never mentioned the Noahide laws, which I think is just extremely suspect, because I know he knows about them. And really, if you're going to complain about Jewish power, that's the only thing worth actually alerting people to. It's the end goal of all of it. It's the thing that actually poses a threat to the world. And um, I think it's very suspicious when these people that are, you know, fa- you know, fashion themselves as these uh, uh, people brave enough to take on the Jewish lobby, but they never mention this. And this is extremely disturbing. And all of it is factual. And all of it is, is a matter of public record. I mean, it's not hard to verify the existence of these laws and the fact that they're already sneaking them into our, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> to our law, our public law books are, and across the world too. It's not just in America. This is like a huge agenda that's just, you know, growing and growing and they have no resistance. So anyway, very suspicious that he never mentioned that. Um, but he got this reputation of being somebody who was willing to call them out, you know, and now uh, his entire, I mean, almost every single stream he does, he starts viciously spiraling about the Trinity and about the divinity of Jesus and don't even get him started on the idea of being saved by faith, right? But especially the Trinity. And if you actually look into how the rabbis um, justify considering Christianity idolatry, more so than uh, Islam, right? Um, Islam is is overall uh, kosher. It's overall Noahide approved. Um, there's a, tr- this is how they will achieve peace in the Middle East. I, I really believe that. Um, it is like a form of Sharia as it is. And um, I really believe that uh, that they will join forces. We already see it in the works. There's a lot on the website that I had mentioned that will explain that further. But they will, they will team up together. And um, it's really Christianity that they take the most issue with. And this idea of Jesus being God. Now, I, I it, it would appear that they wouldn't even care so much if you called him your Messiah, so long as you don't acknowledge him as God in the flesh. And that's why they take this take aim at the Trinity. So, um, first, I'll I'll talk about Owen Benjamin and how he has just made it his life's mission uh, over the past year, it seems, to uh, nonsensically and unconvincingly attack the Trinity and he's just inexplicably immune to all reasoning and sound doctrine and plenty of well-meaning, very intelligent believers who actually were fans of his trying to explain it and, and telling him, you know, it's it, trying to really emphasize that uh, where he's really going wrong is by attacking the, the divinity of Jesus. You know, if he wants to, cause he, you know, he, he tries to hide behind the idea that he just doesn't understand how three can be one and, 
uh, all that stuff. You know, and I don't I don't know that it really matters if we understand all of that. But when you start attacking the the idea that of Jesus as God in the flesh, that's where this that's where the the uh, damnable part of it enters in. And it really seems to me that he has established a reputation over the past couple of years as somebody that let's say anybody that would be inclined to be suspicious of the Jewish agenda would trust him because he has seemingly, you know, uh, put it all on the line uh, uh, to call them out. And he's even been labeled an anti-Semite. Um, so they think he's the real deal. They trust him. Those people that might be suspicious otherwise, they feel comfortable with him. And then he starts uh, really preconditioning them for the Noahide laws, you know, if they're if they're Christian by attacking the Trinity. Everything that he te- everything that he harps on right now, he talks about Mormonism being great, um, and a lot of these other Christian cults, which are all Noahide approved, also um, for the most part, especially the Mormons. And um, he has been for the past like year or more pushing the idea of Chrislam, the blending of Christianity and Islam. He's all but said that, that, you know, Muslims are saved, that they don't have to, to- he thinks that, that the differences between, you know, Christianity and uh, Islam are so minor uh, that, that, you know, that of course Muslims can, you know, have, must be saved because they respect Jesus and because they consider him a, a great prophet and all of that. And all of these things are just easily refuted in scripture and any any basic like just fundamental abcs of the bible right and I, and he is intelligent enough that i don't believe it's plausible that he hasn't come to understand these things yet because i have seen him walk through other realizations where i see his his process of deduction i know he's smart enough to figure this out it's not actually to me it's not believable at all that you can't that he hasn't figured this out by now especially as much heat as he's taken and pushback i really think it's on purpose and I, and it's not the only case of this, because then there's another guy, a lot of people may have heard of this guy, Brandon Tatum, the officer Tatum. He is sponsored by TPUSA, a notorious uh, pro-Zionist organization. They, they're they like conservative ink, basically. And he is one of their, uh, their talents, for lack of a better word. And he recently, now he'd always just come off like a... Uh, like a solid you know basic christian now i am not saying that i thought his gospel understanding was solid i never heard him you know clearly express the gospel but the point is is that any um any average you know christian whether you know in in truth or in name only would have regarded him as just a straight up and down you know uh conventional christian and just over the past month or two he has out of left field. I mean, he's not somebody that, he, you know, he's not particularly intellectual. He's not somebody that typically takes on controversial subjects like this. Now, he might take on a lot of things like, you know, exposing the liberals or, you know, the leftist ideology or whatever, but he doesn't, uh, he doesn't pick fights within, you know, the conservative realm or the Christian realm. Very strange that he suddenly decided to come out and attack the notion of Jesus as God and the Trinity. And it's even strange. Yes, go on. I was just going to say what you're saying here about this particular person. Um, It would seem that the legalists, who we know are not saved anyway, if they really believe that salvation is through works, are going to love this and actually go right along with it. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. That's why I thought everything we were talking about was just the perfect lead-in. Yes, absolutely. Because uh, Owen Benjamin... uh, you know, he, he, he can't he can't stop ranting about the idea of how stupid it is to think you're saved by faith without actually doing the work, without actually, uh, you know, uh, doing what Jesus said to do, following his example. That's because if Jesus isn't God, then he's just a role model, which is why it's so uh, appealing to, to either legalists. You know, and and really, that's that the spirit of the Pharisee, right? It's so appealing to the Pharisee to 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 denigrate Jesus as just a man, because then he does become just an example, and everything he taught as an example is 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 you know is fine with a Pharisee or a legalist or even a, mm-hmm. a Talmudist Jew. Um, you know, they don't have any qualms with the, those things, um, but they have a, a major problem with the idea of being saved by his vicarious righteousness as in none of your own. And mm-hmm. yes, Brandon Tatum, 
is another example of that. I mean, I can't say that I've heard him become being overly legalistic, but this is why it doesn't even make sense that he's just on his own of his own accord decided to go here. Cause he's, like I said, he's not very deep in his understanding biblically. He's not even the type where you would think that he'd sit here and ponder things like this. And yet suddenly he's decided to come out and make a fool of himself. Cause he, I mean, he makes a fool of himself cause he can't defend his argument, uh, uh, rejecting the Trinity and the divinity of Jesus. And mm-hmm. I, I think it's, you know, to, to, to understand where this is coming from, look no further than who sponsors him, TPUSA. Now, either somebody's gotten a hold of him and manipulated him into actually believing this, or he's uh, put up to teaching this. But I think a lot of us can probably think of examples over the past couple of years of people that they wouldn't expect who've suddenly come out uh, questioning the Trinity. They, you know, people trying to cast it as some t- sort of Catholic quirk or you know catholic false teaching and it, it's it, call it what you want the godhead what's important is understanding uh, the, the nature of jesus right and 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 why jesus had to be god in the flesh in order that he could even do what he you know what he claimed to have done for us when you know absolutely did do for us but uh mm-hmm. he claimed to have died for the sins of the world i mean th- this is uh impossible for i mean any a regular man to do. I mean, why would that, why would that work? <laughs> why, would, why would just somebody dying somehow pay for atone for the sins of the whole world? It makes no mm. sense. It only makes sense if he's God in the flesh. And so when you take that away, you take it all away. Right. And that's, that's why I think, that's why I think the Noahide laws specifically target that aspect of Christianity. Cause it's really the easiest way to take the salvific aspect of christianity away to make people renounce it under the guise of idolatry right um i really think that that's that's why that's why satan chose that particular aspect of it um and it is so tied into the idea of grace right so it's really like it's 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 like killing multiple birds with one stone if you attack uh the divinity of jesus and the trinity and um anyway so i just wanted to to point that out because uh I see, I see these wheels turning and I see more and more people unwittingly or wittingly falling into line with this agenda that I, you know, I really do believe that this is, you know, going to come to fruition. I really do believe that this is, this is the plan. It's the only thing that really explains everything that we're seeing right now. Ben and I were talking about it the other night. Um, and so much of what we're seeing culturally is explained if you, if you, consider the idea that that the powers that be for, you know they need us to embrace what is really like a, a very conservative you know in you know in, in politically or, or you know moralistically um uh, very religious like uh, uh, like whole new code of conduct whole new way of the world operating you know it, it's like a return to this um almost a theocracy basically how mm-hmm. would we how could we get the current world that we see to that point well you could drive people over the edge with the exact opposite which is what we're seeing we're seeing the exa- you know that uh, so much like just obviously uh evil obviously uh, uh just anti every natural human instinct especially like for that of the, the family anybody who's a parent shoved down our throats they're trying to make it a, a matter of you know of law that we that we can't even if you look at the equality act i mean they want it to be impossible and illegal for churches to be able to refuse to hire um gay or trans uh pastors or uh you know uh, employees whatsoever they want to make it illegal for schools to 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 decline to hire let's say a trans PE coach right so so basically Mm -hmm. they're trying to make they're trying to enforce um the ability for a like let's say a a a man dressed up as a woman to come in and be in the locker room with your little girls because they're the PE coach that that's literally what the Equality Act you know uh it uh, aims to do I'm not sure if they actually passed it yet but it's so clearly not what you would do if what you really wanted was for the average person to embrace this radical ideology. You would not, this is not gradual. It's, it's way too much, way too fast. 
this is what you do when you want people to snap. And to me, if you think about the non hide laws and you actually look at them and, and how they will play out and what, what the world would look like under such a system, it, it actually makes sense. They're supposed to be the solution to the current problem of the quote unquote evil left. I, I really think that that's what we're seeing. And um, honestly, if I didn't have that bit of information, I would be completely lost right now. I'd be so confused. I would just, mm. I don't know, what, you know, trying to make sense of, I mean, I would understand what God promises will happen eventually, but I wouldn't understand what I'm seeing right now and how it all fits and, and why would Satan be doing what he's doing right now? It would be very confusing. It would also be relatively easy to think that, uh, well, I guess the vaccine must be the mark of the beast. I guess it must be all about to be over just like right now because, you know, we've been conditioned to think that the, 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 the final beast system, the new world order is going to, I guess, be some sort of leftist dystopia. And um, I don't think that that comes from scripture. I think that comes from a lot of pop culture, conspiracy culture, uh, uh, priming um, from people that weren't actually solid Christians or Christians, Christian at all over the past 30 years. You know, they've, they've told us what to expect. And I think it's been misdirection. Because I think this is really what, what we're going through right now. This is all the problem that the Antichrist will come riding in on a white horse to save us from. That's mm -hmm. what I think. And to me, nothing else makes any sense. If, if I didn't think, I mean, I would just, man, I can't tell you how frustrated and confused I would be if I, if I didn't have that little uh, uh, part of the equation. I really feel explains a lot of it. It's just because to me, all of this seems like reverse psychology. It's just so annoying, though, because it just keeps dragging out, right? It just keeps mm -hmm. getting crazier and crazier. And it's like, when are people going to snap? <laughs> you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just as a Christian, the only reason I haven't snapped is because I am a Christian and because I, I um, you mm -hmm. know, I know what the, what God promises, and what the Bible promises. And I know that the, this is, you know, the Titanic and there's no, there's no, uh, <laughs> Don't there's no save saving this ship. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if it weren't for that, I would have snapped by now. This is just too much. <laughs> right. And, and I really think that pressure's building on purpose. So anyway, oh, yeah. I'd like to hear what you guys think about it, but. You, you mean you think it's futile to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic sister angel? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can call me a fatalist <laughs> that way, but. Um, Did know, anyone. Seems... Go on. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I, no, I was just mumbling. Oh, well, I wanted to give Ben and uh, Jordan a chance to say anything they wanted to say before I, I go to my topic, which I think actually ties into what we're talking about, too. Yeah, well, <laughs> what I want to say, just touching on the fact that the Godhead was a Roman Catholic invention that they are claiming, um, first of all, I mean, aside from what's in the Bible, that should be the obvious. But if we go to um, the quote-unquote apostolic fathers, I don't like to use the word fathers, but I actually have my copy pulled up in front of me and I was looking at some quotes while Angel was talking because we know Ignatius, who was actually one of the disciples of the disciple John, um, he uses some of these words to describe Jesus. Um, he says, Jesus Christ, our God, Christ, our God, our God, Jesus Christ, God, mm -hmm. even Jesus Christ, God himself being manifest in human form, God existing in flesh. And in a letter that he wrote to Polycarp, which <laughs> fun fact, that's my personal favorite. <laughs> but he says, we ought to bear all things for the sake of God that he may also bear with us, be ever becoming more zealous than what thou art, weigh carefully the times, look for him who is above all time, eternal and invisible, yet who became visible for our sakes, impalpable and impassable, yet who became passable on our account, and who in every kind of way suffered for our sakes. And Polycarp actually said, um, which again, my favorite, I love Polycarp, but he said in his letter to the Philippians, uh, who is also a disciple of John, by the way, 
Now mm-hmm. may the God, our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal high priest himself, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, build you up in faith and truth and in all gentleness and in all avoidance of wrath and in forbearance and long suffering and patience, endurance and impurity. And may he grant unto you all the portion among his saints and to us with you and to all who are under heaven, who shall believe in our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, and on his father ha- on, on his father that has raised him from the dead. And these men preceded Roman Catholicism by nearly 200 years. Praise the Lord. Okay. One, one thing so I, it's, I, it's doubtful that they created the, the concept of the God here then. I'm sorry, Ben, go ahead. No, no, I, I thought you were done. Sorry. No, you're good. Oh, well, with uh, respect to what Angel was saying, um, I, 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 I don't get I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm just saying uh, this is kind of kind of how I see it uh, unfolding, just based on the clues I see in Scripture and things are going on now. And it doesn't mean that there won't be multiple cycles. Like, I'm not saying, like, oh, no, we're at the very edge of the end of the days here. I'm not saying that. Uh, I know some people take that, and, and that's a real possibility. I don't know. But I, I guess all I'm saying is that, um, you know, I kind of th- see it whereas, like, like you said, Angel, there, they, this, some kind of Noah Hyde law, this, you know, super Pharisaical law coming into play, being implemented worldwide, so to speak. And you see this Noah Hyde law being talked about. Uh, in fact, I, I pulled up that site you're referencing, and it's talking about, you know, it being in Australia, Japan, Europe. It's all over the place. Uh, looks like they've got the te- their tendrils all over uh, in, in all major governments. Um, and they're really just kind of wait, waiting to pull the trigger, and it almost seems as if that's what there's going on. So almost like there's like this, like you said, this all the stuff is coming, you know, it's in your face, laughing at you, mocking us, basically, you know, drag queens reading to kids in the library, etc. Um, and there's going to be such a, uh, you know, the pendulum's going to swing one way, but it's going to swing much further in the opposite direction. And and so there's going to be like a, like I said, a, some kind of cleanup operation, if you will, and just like say, you know, but but it'll, it'll be. It'll be a form of godliness, but denying its power, which is the which is the Holy Spirit. It's going to be a, a, a legalistic godliness, which is with the a Pharisees. That's what the law is. Theocracy. Yes, yep. and so the like I said, it's like in Israel, uh, when Christ said, you know, when a demon is cast out, yeah, that we'll clean up the, we'll clean up this earth pretty good, I think, and then it'll be ripe for uh, the demons to come in five full stronger, and that's where you're going to see. Potentially, I think that the the uh, man of sin being revealed because it's called it's called the man of sin or the man of lawlessness, and I think he's mm-hmm. basically going to say, "Hey, I'm the God who freed you from this tyrant God." Yeah. Uh, from you know, the, it goes back to the garden that freed you from the the God's uh, trying to keep you from doing what you what what you uh, you know what what it, it try, he's trying this That's God trying to blind you. I'm yeah, this yep. God, you know, the That's God, the Bible trying Gentile to blind ring. you. Yeah. Yeah. The God of the Bible is trying to blind you and keep you from, you know, fulfilling the lust of the flesh, essentially. And that's why Revelation, for example, says they would do that, even though they're getting these plague after plague after plague, uh, they blaspheme God of the Bible. They, they uh, you know, they do not repent of their sorceries. Because, again, I think you're mm-hmm. going to say that they, they, Satan is winning or going to win. And after and the this tyranny is, of the harlot with him, yes, after the tyranny yes. of the Noahide laws, which he betrayed. See, they the Jews they they don't believe that the Antichrist, that the, the Moshiach, is any more God than they are. They believe that the the ultimate fulfillment of all of their you know prophecies is that the world will worship them, the Jews, as God, and that He will be you know equal with them, but a political leader, and wow. He will betray them by declaring Himself God in the temple. Right? That's why they have wow, to flee. It lines up pretty well. It lines up. Yeah, that's what I think, and then I think you're right. I think it will turn on its head. I think that it will be yet another swing of the pendulum. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Like, like he, that, that's yeah, why he yes. would become the man of lawlessness. Mm-hmm. I, that's, I mean, you know, well, well, that, this, that's, this is all speculation, but that's, that's the only thing I can make sense of right now. I think that really, really, uh, it strikes a nerve for me, you know, that, it, that it, this really kind of makes things fit, but. Well, you've explained well, it before. You've said it before, the way you phrased it before gave me chills. Like, I just, like, uh, I was like, uh, even before I even thought about it, like, you said, it's like, uh, yep, that's it, you know. And that's where you talk about the, you know, having the whore on her back and, and flinging her off. And then, uh, and I was, as I was reading Revelation, I was like, this lines up perfectly with what you were saying, you know. And telling um, the world, this Gentiles to strip her naked, you know, drag her through the streets. 
you know, and I think that that will be, you know, when Christ comes in, save the remnant at the very, very last, but she's going to revel in her brief reign and, uh, and turn the world against her. You know, that's what I, that's what I, I think, you know, when I look at the Noah laws, because you have to understand they, they, they enjoy special status with these laws. These laws don't exactly apply to them. This is how the Gentiles get to earn their keep in their world. And they believe that they will have 2,000 Gentile slaves each in the world to come. So that should tell us something about what kind of conditions we'd be living under. Um, but imagine how much trust and praise uh, the man of sin would uh, earn himself if he freed. Like, so initially he looks al- allied with them and then he turns wow. on them to liberate the world. Right. That's, wow. you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, genius well, but, wicked, uh, wicked genius yeah okay. not you. <laughs> yeah i wanted to point out a couple of things that you guys said okay in second timothy uh three five uh start was well, starting at verse two it says for for men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous boasters proud blasphemers disobedience to parents unthankful unholy without natural affection truth breakers false accusers incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come into the knowledge of the truth, now, as Jannies and Jamborees withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Now, if you go uh, to Romans 1.16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also the Greek. So as you were saying, Angel, um, you know, the, the form of godliness but denying the power the power that they're denying is the gospel itself, which, of course, if believing in Jesus makes you an idolater, then there's the elimination of the gospel right there. Because the, the good news is what he has done. And they're saying he did. And then uh, we know the other scripture that talks about uh, any spirit. And uh, what is it? First, first John. Uh, I just lost it. The, any spirit confesses not. That Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh. Um, that that spirit is the spirit of Antichrist. So you see how all these New Age teachings and all that deny that. And they talk about Christ's consciousness coming on people. Or he didn't come to say he was the Christ. He came so that you could be come like the Christ yourself. Right. And it so, also carries with it the context of God in the flesh. Right. Because that that phrase mm-hmm. to come in the flesh. Right. I think that that harkens to the fact that the word Christ encompasses something that, you know, inherently implies God, you know, God himself. Right. That that's that's part of. Yes, that, it you is. Know, the, it the very much is. Understanding. Is it? Yeah. yeah. I never actually looked into that, but I, I feel like that's kind of it has to be because that's why yeah. you, it, it was a theologically was loaded term. Yeah, it's a theologically yes. loaded term. The Jews would have known what it meant. You know, it goes back to the Son of Man, which they knew what meant divine, the Son mm-hmm. of God, uh, the Messiah. It, it, it's a theologically loaded term. And, um, uh, you know, what's interesting, too, as you're talking, and I'm putting together something I think it's fascinating, and I think I'm on to something. I know it sounds crazy, but, um, you know, it's really good because you, you guys both just quoted Bert, uh chapters of the Bible that seem to contradict each other a little bit. And I think I know why. But, um, you know, for example, in John, First John, he says, uh, we know it's the, he basically says, we know it's the last days because many antichrists have come. That's how we know it's the last days or the last hour. Yet in Second Timothy, I think you read her, Timothy, uh, he says, in the last days. So it's as if the death days have not yet come. And, so, and I, I read those, I think a lot of people are confused. Like, okay, well, are, are we in the last days or are they yet to come? Uh, and I think I have a, uh, I think I'm coming on to something very fascinating about that. Um, and maybe I'll share it next week. But there is that. I think it is confusion. Uh, I, I get confused when I read that because some some verses seem to suggest that okay, it's the last days are now, or or yet the, or the last days are yet to come. So what is it? You know, um, 
So yeah, I'd love to uh, hear what you think about that because that is a hard thing to explain to people too. It's like, going to tie it. It's gonna tie some, it, it ties a bunch of things together. It ties in revelation. It ties in, it, you know, it ties in uh, preterism versus futurism. And it goes into all that stuff. And I think it, it, it it's, it's the only thing that I can find that explains it all. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll discuss it next week. Um, just kind of touch on it. Cause I don't have it figured all figured out yet, but I definitely think I'm onto something because it, it, it answers everyone's objections and everyone's conflicts essentially. Um, and it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. That was yeah, that first be- John four, two, uh, hereby know ye the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God in every spirit then confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist where whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now is already in the world. Uh, okay. Before we get go any uh, further, um, cause we're coming near the end of the broadcast. I want to make sure uh, that I get to at least we talk about it a little bit because I I think it does tie in to this, which is cancel culture. Uh, le- I want to tie it in to what we're talking about tonight versus a bunch of other roads we could go down. And I want to show you why I think they're doing this as well. Now, Angel, I don't know where you come down on this issue. Um, I support what they call cancel culture, and I'm going to explain why in a minute because they've renamed it. And this is what the spirit of Antichrist also does. For example, <clears throat> excuse me, they change the, the the Bible says that the man of sin is going to change times and laws. And and Jordan and I come at this from two different angles. Jordan noticed that in the 1800s is when most of these religious cults began to spring up, particularly here in the United States and uh, and around the world uh, or the known Western world, let's say. Um, And then I noticed that in the 1800s, a lot of laws in the United States began to change. The suspension of certain things, the installation of others, the changing of things, the changing of words, the changing of, for example, the way the medical system operated, where it went from naturopathic to allopathic medicine was in the late 1800s, just before the turn of the, what they call the 20th century. So um, when I, when I was thinking about it and I was seeing how everybody was saying, uh, we've got to stop this cancel culture. It's terrible. I I was thinking, well, 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 hold up. What you're really talking about is the abridging of free speech. It has always been the case in, in this country. I mean, if you go all the way back to like the Boston Tea Party and other things, right, where people got upset about things and they said, we ain't having this. We're going to put a stop to this. We don't like you. We don't want to support you. It's always been your right. If you don't like something to take your money, for example, if a corporation was doing something wrong, uh, you could say, I won't support you anymore. I won't do business with you more. You get mistreated somewhere. You didn't have to go back. That's your right. If you saw a it used to be. True. I don't, I don't think people bother anymore. But when you see things on TV that were detestable, any of the advertisers that played in between that program, you could you could write them or call them up and say, if you don't pull your advertising from that wicked uh, program, I'm not buying your product anymore. I won't support you anymore. And they would get nervous and say, oh, they pull their and uh, uh, money from the commercial and say, stop running in between that. And either that program would apologize and stop that mess or they pull that program from the air. So I wanted to show you something. They've renamed it. This has always existed in, in, in the Western world, but particularly here in America. It was called boycotting. So now they've renamed it to cancel culture. And they're trying to demonize cancel culture because if they can demonize cancel culture, you can't speak out against Noahide law. You can't speak out against all these different corporations that are doing evil and run up over top of people. And then you can't pull your money or, or, or speak out to people through social media and everything. Let's, let's boycott this organization like blacks did uh, in the South when they got mistreated by certain things. Like, you know, with the bus company and it's all, you know, very uh, famous and well-known where they didn't ride the buses 
for a period of time to get those policies changed. The different things that were going on, the different dynamics throughout the country. And any time any group of people could say, I don't like you, I don't want to associate you, I'm not going to give you my money, and I'm going to pull it out. And I'm going to speak out against it, and I'm going to stir other people up against it. They're trying to stop that. They're trying to demonize cancel culture. Okay, so boycott is a term that was used to, uh, it says, to refuse to buy, use, or participate in something as a way of protesting, to stop using the goods or services of a company, country, etc., until changes are made. All right? Um, to engage in a concerted refusal to have dealings with a person, a store, an organization, etc., usually to express disapproval or to force acceptance of certain conditions. For example, boycotting American products. This has always been. Okay, now this well, they term also originated came against the boycotting of Israel recently. I don't know if you know that, but exactly. people were trying to boycott Israel. Yep, and not yeah, and, and they shut that down real quick. They they, <laughs> they they shut that down. You know, you're not allowed to cancel culture that. Uh, you you they you if you if you're a company and you try to like what's it called uh, uh, BDS a BDS means boy, boycott divest and sanction for the abuses against the Palestinians, you don't get government contracts. Right. So what I'm saying is the reason that they're demonizing, first of all, they call it boycotting. People might, well, we don't want, we don't want to, we don't want to draw attention to the, that's always been the American spirit to boycott things they don't like. So we'll call it cancel culture and demonize that. If if this term originated from a man named Charles or because of a man named Charles C. Boycott in 1897, he was an English land agent in Ireland who was ostracized for refusing to reduce rents. The first known use was in 1880. There you go, Jordan. So uh, like we were saying, something strange started happening in the 1800s, either good things or bad, but they started doing all kinds of stuff in, in the 1800s. Now, I wanted to get to the definition, I haven't lost it here, <laughs> of cancel culture. Okay, so hold on. I lost my window. The whole walk and chew bubblegum thing at the same time. Well, why are you doing that? I Just know. I think the problem with it is that boycott, like what we're seeing right now is not like people actually boycotting for the most part to cancel somebody. It's corporations canceling them. And I think that's what people take issue with. But somehow that's bled over into somehow challenging the idea of, 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 of a boycott or a cancel culture in and of itself, which which we have every right to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is, is it's not organic at all because people are getting canceled. Uh, people, people are pulling their, you know, sponsorships of others and stuff over like one anonymous Twitter commenter. And it's not organic. It's not in the actual spirit of the boycott where people make their voices heard and the company feels it, or at least has reason to think it, it will happen. In this case, companies are acting against their best interests because the majority of people, you know, uh, will lay on one side of the issue, but like one little fringe radical will will make a stink about somebody not being you know radical left enough, and the company will alienate most of their customer base to appease this tiny fringe element because it's not it, it's not organic. They're not doing it for the reason. It's not. It's, yeah. Well, see, this is my also, point exactly, though. Yeah. The reason mm-hmm. that they're doing this and these companies are going along because they're all in bed together, you know, it's like seven yep. corporations owned all anyway, is to to demonize and vilify boycotting. So, in other mm-hmm. words, what what you're just saying, if everybody Good knows, point. look, the the masses actually want this corporation to continue doing whatever they were doing. Well, we're not against it, but they got a fringe group that's doing cancel culture. Oh, we, we've got to stop cancel culture. Aha, problem, reaction, solution. They want yeah. you to stop cancel culture. So they're going to pick the most ridiculous the stuff. The only power we have to fight, you know, maybe the Noah Hyde laws. Exactly. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. So look at the definition of cancel culture according to, and I wanted to use uh, Wikipedia because it's going to give us what like the current trending version of this is. 
Cancel culture is a modern form of ostracism in which someone is thrust out of social or professional circles, whether it be online or social media or in person. Those who are subject to the ostracism are said to have been canceled. The expression cancel culture has mostly negative connotations as in, and, in, and is commonly used in debates on free speech and censorship. So they are trying to demonize <laughs> by renaming it and then putting it on the most ridiculous aspect. In other words, what most people would actually be for, they'll be against. And then what most people would actually be against, they'll be for. But cancel culture will went out to agitate the people, to cause the people to say, let's end cancel culture, which would be eliminating your right to boycott, your right to free speech, your right to speak out against something. Because the stuff that's coming, they know people are going to, there's going to be a backlash for it. I know. I keep saying that when people will try to point out like, oh, it's hypocritical. Conservatives are, you know, they're supposed to be against cancel culture. But now they're they're, you know, now they're, you know, uh, basically calling for, you know, a boycott of, I don't know, let's say Major League Baseball. And I, say, and I keep pointing out, wait, did anybody say there's something wrong with boycotting? <laughs> Right, like since when is there something wrong with boycotting? Um, but, you know that's not at all what what's happening with cancel culture. They're trying to trick us into thinking that, but there's not enough of these crazy radical uh, uh, lunatics to put any type of dent in a business in a company's bottom line, unless the, the company sells I don't know like uh, hipster like you know uh, uh, temporary oh, mustache tattoos. Oh. Or um, or like skinny jeans, I don't know. Like they're, they're they don't have much power to to uh, to make a dent in any of these companies. Like we saw Gillette, right? Uh, Gillette keeps making these com like made this crazy commercial that would basically alienate most of its most of its customers. The, these companies keep doing these things that just alienate most of their customers, and we're supposed to believe that they're doing it to appease. They're, they're trying to gaslight us into thinking there's this huge majority of people who think gender's not real and who think that like white people basically all need to commit mass suicide and that um uh the, all this crazy leftist craziness there's not there's not that these people are a figment of your imagination twitter if even most of those people on twitter are even real they represent two mm -hmm. percent of the population okay right. the, the, I, I, and and the, you know unless you live in like a I'm not saying that there's not plenty of people that are like just because of their own conformist nature, kind of like conforming to a lot of like the liberal media talking points just because that's in their nature to be conformist. I know Ben suffers that problem. You know, that is happening. I do think that there's a lot of people and those people you can spot because they weren't necessarily radical in their in and of themselves, but because they're just such a conformist. They see the media and only the media pushing this this agenda, this uh, craziness, and they start conforming to it. Like, yeah, you know, I guess we can't tell what gender a baby is until they're eighteen. All you know, because they're just they're just sheep. Uh, but for the most part, this is does none of this crap represents just the average person at all. But they're gaslighting us into thinking that 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 these people are everywhere, and and that's I think it serves two purposes. One, it's to make us freak out. And snap eventually, but also too, it's to make the people that actually are that way emboldened because they imagine to have, that they have much more support than they really have, and that's why they are so bold and they are so shameless that they, they you know, a lot of the people that are actual true believing leftists uh, pretty much don't even conceal the fact they don't think you deserve to live if you don't agree with them. Now that is going to put them in a very bad position when the population finally has enough, because who's going to come to their rescue? knowing the evil they wished on just regular people for having regular mm -hmm. values and wanting regular things in life. Uh, nobody's going to feel bad for them. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're, if they get, you know, uh, put on the chopping block, nobody's going to come to the rescue because, because they showed their true character that they would have ha had you killed for, for just being normal, just for just, you know, wanting to raise a family or believing boys and girls exist. Like that's that's mm -hmm. it draws these people out to and and, and it also creates a, a an image in our minds of a much bigger villain than we're actually up against. But it's really these corporations that are conspiring together to gaslight us. And it's not because the corporations are inherently leftist either. 
I don't believe that for a second. This is all push pull. This is all Hegelian dialectic. It's all reverse psychology. That's yeah, why you find com- so many. Go on, Ben. Oh, I think I think these companies are owned. You know, they're funded by the state too. You know, they they pretend they're companies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they make profit from people, but they're. I think our own. We're paying their for their garbage with their own tax money. That's another thing that the occult loves to, you know, have you eat yourself essentially. Um, and yep. I, I'm sure that, you know, that, that we are funding all this crap, which, which makes my blood boil. Oh, well, oh yeah. And they'll, uh, they'll push being, it to the nth degree. They're being Make it a fund abortion. Useful. Right. And rub it in your face. Well, yeah, they're being Easy. used as useful idiots too, as, as mm-hmm. it's attributed that Lennon said it, but it's argued that maybe he did not. But if, if that is true, I mean, they will use groups as battering rams to destroy um, the pillars of a society so that when, you know, when it crumbles, they'll be blamed the people that they used and people will turn against them while there's, they're the hidden hand behind the scene. (gasps) You know that it's often said that like the goal of Marxism is like, it's almost like a mystery, right? Because it's like somebody referred to it the other night as communist magic, right? Mm-hmm. Like they don't really know how it's supposed to work, but somehow they think if they can just implement this radical Marxist critical theory agenda, um, that, uh, the, that the world will be a better, you know, like, like th- they can just knock down, tear down society and that they'll be able to, even though they don't actually have a, a realistic way of making it work, this new society where everything is, I don't know, uh, uh, utopian. I think that's because Satan only ever needed people to strive uh, to create the chaos, right? What they don't realize they're working toward is this end times reality where the Antichrist comes in. But this communism, it's, it's not the end goal at all. Uh, I mean, I guess you could consider maybe like there's some communist elements to perhaps like whatever he his reign might look like. Right. But for the most part, it's really just a device, a tool to destroy the existing society. And the reason why it's almost a mystery as to what the ultimate like uh, uh, the end goal is supposed to look like or how it's even supposed to be um, achievable is because. It, it, this whole ideology was really just a, a, a means by which Satan would motivate people to, to, to be the battering ram, like you said. Um, and it's not actually possible for, for any utopia or, or, you know, uh, 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 what, what I could, you know, like the antichrist, like new world order, whatever, none of that, none of that could actually exist without, you know, Satan putting his guy in, which is why it's always such a, a mystery as to how it's supposed to actually work in real life, because it's really just a a, a, a tool, and a lot of these these um, communist revolutions have been dress rehearsals. Um, and I think the point is not the actual communist revolution. I think it's supposed to be the the reaction to it. I think what what um, what we're really looking at is uh, is like a, a a Weimar situation that they're trying to instigate, and how did they create? You know, uh, worldly Nazi Germany is well. They used the Weimar Republic, which was basically like a communist um, revolution in Germany that caused this incredible debauchery to take hold. Um, every manner of just just wicked, like you know, <laughs> uh, unadulterated sin. You know, pedophilia, uh, just open prostitution, mother daughter prostitution, everything you could think of going on in Weimar. And um, it caused the German people to, 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 to end up supporting a strong man who promised to restore order. Mm-hmm. Right. And I really think that's a beta test for what we're seeing. But I think that's what communism seems so illogical. And like it's like it's ne- it could never work because it's really just a trick to get people to create that chaos and the conditions by which a savior can enter and restore order to, to the people. Um, yeah. And, it, it, and that's but, why I think a, a lot of them, uh, they think again, you know, communism, Marxism, you read on paper, it sounds right at first, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, of course, everyone should share the wealth and we should all love each other and, and you know, e- equality, it's a, it's a utopia, but it's, it, they don't, they don't factor in the wicked human heart. And, and so it, exactly. it, it's, it's a, a denial it's a of the, the nature. 
Yes, it's a denial of the sin nature, and it's a worship of man and his ideas. It's it's to take God out of it, really. It's a worship. Man can solve this problem, and man is good, uh, but th that's what they don't see, that man is not good, and that's why it always turns into, um, you know, it just brings about ruin. Well, the same thing happens under capitalism. I mean, yeah. the word capitalism means to capitalize. If you look it up in the dictionary, one of the synonyms is advantage well if you're taking advantage then someone is at a disadvantage so well, if you that's the problem is sin there's wait, no way wait, let me finish it. let me finish though when you look in the bible when the bible talks about the situation with ananias and sapphira they came together sold everything and brought it back and everybody had what they have need what they had need of and Ananias and Sapphira got in trouble because they decided to keep back a portion of what they had and hide it when they had every right to keep what they wanted, then, but they weren't being honest about it. They decided to try to lie to the Holy Spirit. But what we see, the Bible says they had all things in common. And so there are a lot of people who are saying, are, are, have they been trying to actually keep us from doing that? Because if you think about all of the so-called cult things like Jim Jones, uh, Waco, they have tried to demonize people coming together and having co-ops and coming together in groups and buying land and working together. That's just as another people. word for a village. That's just another word well, for a village. That's how that's how any capitalist system starts is people have I have need of this and I have surplus of this and you trade. That's that's just like the thing is, is there's no I don't believe that they have to conspire to keep us from like figuring out this perfect way to exist there is no perfect way to it no like, i'm not saying it's the church angel i'm it's, not it's saying different it's it'll never apply to the lost world we could never apply that i i'm not saying lost the lost world. world i'm talking about believers well, if yeah, we came together that. and it's under the banner of the love of christ and we're doing the things if, if if a group of believers decided let's go start a community i would love and, that and <laughs> but see but this is what i'm saying have they actually tried to block believers from doing that by having these big examples of these cult leaders? They always have some cult leader. If you notice, it's never just a group that got together and couldn't get along. It's always a right. cult leader. Right. And I'm right. I'm starting well, to think to, to, it's just to discourage independence. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's to discourage yeah. a breakaway community. Uh, absolutely. But if yeah. that community got big enough, it would inevitably fall to the same problem. I'm just saying, like, like I don't believe that believers are exempt from the same exact problems that the lost world is. Like, in terms of, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with working for what you have or what, or for you know a fair trade. I, I think um, it, it you can like you can't count on people to like just because they're believers, you can't count on them to be fair mm -hmm. and to be generous. So I do think it would be a like they do discourage this. It's just a discouraging independence. But really, um, I don't think that. Like, how did any how did any like uh, society start? If it's a village, I mean, people were kind of banding together to cooperate and work with each other to make you know, like you have this, I need this. Like that's uh, that's that's like a very fundamental, basic description of of really how our society is now. The difference is these corporations come in. And kind of uh, artificially, artificially uh, control supply and demand, and all types of other things in a very complex society. But if you were to look at um, just the very basic, like what capitalism is, it's really just really what you described. I mean, it's really just um, uh, uh, trading, <laughs> trading. Like you need this, I need this, and yeah, I mean, you could have the motive to want to help your community. Now that's different with the a group of believers there's a larger motive there you know because you're believe it's like a family right you know that's the I the idea of it at least but how 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 sustainable is it because we saw that in I nice and safari like you know this they were believers but they still you know did what they did like this is inevitable so you know i don't i don't know i i, I don't i i think it's like their communism is really just um, an enforcement 
of that principle, right? Where, where, you know, every, all the, all the means of production are owned by the state, I believe. And then, yeah, but you know, that's they, the they difference. The, yeah. Oh yeah. It's yeah. not organically done by the people themselves. It's enforced by the mm -hmm. state, which is um, right. coercion and, you know, uh, compulsory. And whenever it's right. not organic, meaning the people want to do it. See, it'd be different if, you, Ben, Jordan, I, and a dozen other believers said, let's go. We're going to pool some money. We're going to buy some land. We're going to have a co-op. Uh, we'll each get, I don't know, an acre on the land. And we'll, grow, you know, uh, Angel will have chickens and raise eggs. And Ben will raise fish. And Jordan will, I don't beans know. Beans and rabbits. Rabbit. I want to oh, tend beans, rabbits. He'll grow beans and rice. <laughs> okay, uh, Ben wants rabbits. And then, you know. And then um, I'd just be the overseer. No, I was just kidding. I was just kidding. So we, we each come up with something and we each contribute. And this is where trade came from. It's like if Angel had, you know, chickens and Ben had rabbits and Ben gets tired of eating rabbits and Angel's get tired of eating chickens or they want eggs, they, they trade. They, they figure out what's fair and they trade. This is what trade always was. You didn't need, quote unquote, money. So... Um, right. And they don't want us so doing it. Form a currency. Well, <laughs> there's right. one thing I want to add to that because I don't think many people uh, know this, but Karl Marx actually used uh, Acts 432 through 37 mm -hmm. uh, to establish communism. And I think what people mm -hmm. aren't realizing the reason for this communism or this commune. Um, for the believers in Acts 4 was because these believers were under the assumption that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. So they saw no need and they had to band together to fight off the persecution they were facing. So it is a completely different um, atmosphere at that given time with the knowledge that they had. Well, it's, it's becoming that again, but I think it was to pervert this concept. I was suspecting that and I didn't know that Jordan and I'm glad you said it. I think they didn't want us looking in the Bible and going, this is how we ought to do things. And so they actually created a perverted, destructive, wicked uh, model of communism. I still, too, I, think, I, see, I see it as a perversion of grace, essentially, because it demands, yep. it yep. demands, it, it's forced grace, essentially, which is no grace at all. And and they know people will rebel against that and, and, and resent it. When you force someone to do that's what the law did. Love, you know, God says, love me with I have no other gods before me, love with me you know, with all your heart. It demanded righteousness, but it couldn't provide righteousness. And that's what um socialism does. And it basically is it demands that you everyone's treated fairly, but no one it's it it only makes man worse. But at least so uh capitalism at least allows you to be gracious. Right? I don't have to give you something, yeah. I want to give you something. And it's it, it. I'm not saying it's perfect by any means, but, but with fallen mankind, I think it's essentially uh, it's the most uh, system that could line up with man's fallen sin nature. And I think it's the most biblical, too, because the Bible said, again, it says where you know if a man doesn't work, he, he doesn't eat. And where socialism says, right. yes, he does eat. And the the in the Old Testament, for example, and even capitalism, you know, there's opportunity for grace and even provision for people that are that are not. Uh, that are incapable of, of, you know, even in the, in the, in the uh, under the Old Testament, they kept what, what was the quarters of their cropland. They wouldn't uh, harvest that because it was for the stranger and the foreigner, to, you know. So yeah. there was always grace there. But the, the essential rule essentially was, you know, you you don't work, you don't eat. And um, again, uh, at least capitalism, I think it keeps the sin nature in check as best as it can, you know. Uh, again, I know it's corrupted, uh, and, and, and I think what we see today is not really, really capitalism. It's you know, it's it's uh, yeah. it's it's been Fascism. really perverted. And that it's actually socialism essentially, but it's it, it's it's yeah. under the guise of capitalism. Well, the unity of, of 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 corporation and the state is technically right. fascism, and I actually see that that just more and more. But the thing is, is the difference with okay. So what I what I feel like what we're describing here is. <laughs> be it the church or or a family we're talking about a family unit that cooperates because of a greater cause rather than profit right so whether you want to call that a family which is how a family generally operates i mean we cooperate with each other and help each other because we love it because we're family right but then we still have to coexist and interact with the 
with others outside of our tribe. So if our tribe is Christ, you know, our, our fellow believers, we're still not going to be an island unto ourselves. We're going to have to operate and, and interact and exchange with, with unbelievers and surrounding tribes. At that point, that's when what we call capitalism comes into play. Because without that, that higher cause that we're all agreeing upon, yet we still have to trade and interact, all right. there really is is the profit motive and, you know, fair give and take. So that's why, I, you know, uh, I, I think that what we saw in Acts is just is really just like a picture of how families operate. But, you know, if they were to be trading amongst unbelievers, it would it would look very capitalist. Right. Because they're not going to be um, affording just everybody the same, you know, uh, generosity that they will afford their own tribe, you know, because why would you? And so any any, any if you expand the principle of uh, of what we see in Acts, you know, to any like because unless we can find an island out in the middle of nowhere, we're going to have to interact with other people. And, you know, they're not going to care about our Christian values or, 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 or do us a favor because we're Christian if they're unbelievers. So at that point, the only way to do it safely or fairly is to just do it on a profit motive. So that's why I agree. I just think that like, we're, 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 we, I think as believers, we should, you know, I, I think that that's much more what a church should look like rather than what we currently see today, you know, um, in the, in the form of church, which is, is a whole different thing. And they get this expensive building they have to upkeep. And so much of everything just goes into up, you know, uh, uh, maintaining this building, um, uh, as opposed to, uh, trying to look out for each other in a, in a, in a cruel world that doesn't share our values. But at the same time, you know, if you take that church as a, as a, as a body and you make it interact with, you know, people outside the church it's just i mean you wouldn't want that to be a communist or even you know a communist interaction right where 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 we're forced to do something um or or you know and we're not going to force other people to do something the only fair thing to do is to base it around the profit motive i mean that's that's i think that's fair i don't think that that's evil i think it's evil when we do that to each other within a family group or a you know or you know a family group either of actual like blood family or of believers right i think um and i do think that they have you know tried to discourage christians from forming communities like that with the with the whole cult psyop which so much of them were psyops i mean they were like cia experiments basically none of it like very few of them were actually organic i'm not saying that they aren't there aren't some organic cults i mean this is sort of like a pathology um that seems to repeat over and over again but a lot of the big famous ones were had heavy cia interference right and i and I, i'm sure that that was part of it just to discourage that type of um uh independent uh community building where you found a community based on principles based on you know a shared faith as opposed to just randomly because you lived somewhere right but i'm just saying that uh, within that community, you could operate however you want. It would just be like an extended family group at that point, but it would still have to interact with the outside world, at which point, you know, I still think capitalism would be the best bet. In that and even, even in X, even in X, it wasn't really socialism or Marxism there, because if it was, they, they, they would have nothing to give. You know, it, it was already, it would be already, everyone's already, it was a volunteer. Right. It was, uh, you know, personal uh, property. Right, it's personal property where, uh, again, socialism realized in its ideal form, I use that word ideal in quotes, um, basically no one has any property. You, you don't even have your, your own kids aren't your own property. I don't think you, they, some examples, you don't even, they don't think that you even, yeah, you yourself are not right your property. Now. That's going right, on go right now under capitalism. Well, this What's isn't that? really capitalism though, is what we're saying. Like we're not really in a true form of capitalism anymore because that's why we, oh. if we were, we wouldn't see the, the corporations conspiring uh, to really kind of operate against what would appear to be their bottom line profit motive, where they're uh, alienating their cu customer base and losing like tons of, uh, of profit, you know, and, and their stock is, you know, dropping because they, they come out in support of some ridiculous thing that nobody really agrees with. That's not, ca you know, if it were just actual pure capitalism, they would be doing that. You'd be able to vote with your dollar and they would listen. Right now they're just doing the opposite of that because no. they're not... 
operating I, on a profit I, motive anymore. You guys keep missing that capitalism has always been about capitalizing off of someone else, taking advantage. Well, well, I and mean, then also you need to recognize somebody eating too, something that they that you have and they don't, right? In that trade. <laughs> right? Okay. I mean, like if somebody if somebody needs like chicken and you have chickens and they don't, and then but you have something that they, they want and like and they have something that you want. I mean, is is that is that wrong? Like I'm isn't that just trade? Angel, how did this country start? And what was the biggest trade that was going on at the time? Well, this, well, I mean, there's lots of, lots of different things that were at the, at the trade, but even like they were, were trading all types of things. You know, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't think one, it's all about slavery. One very big, I didn't say it was all about, but I said it's one big thing the they were trading. They well, were right, but trading. I mean, that, that doesn't invalidate capitalism. I mean, you know, who, how did they get the slaves? Because the tribes were motivated to sell other other people, the neighboring tribes, because of a profit motive, right? I mean, what, that's just, what? it's not, it's I'm not, not like. I'm not saying, because, yeah, because the Africans, uh, Arabs that's, were that's selling. That's the sin problem, though. That's not the problem of Yeah, trade. well, that's not, no, but that's what, that's what capitalism is based on. Advantage. Well, okay. But I mean, how, I'm, I'm, how would you extend this? This uh, system, you know, you're you're trying to say people should just cooperate based on the common good, but people don't no. agree on what the common no, good I is. No, I said, or people, if people, the the governments have made this almost impossible for people to do now with the various laws they've passed and the different things, especially in this country. I can't speak about other people's country. In this country, they have. There are laws, like you saying, that are laying dormant, where they're saying you can't even grow your own food. And they're already there, okay? So it's 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 mm -hmm. not even subject for debate. All you have to do is go look. And then while we were sleeping, while we were watching TV and going to concerts and doing all these breads and circus things, they were putting this apparatus in place. So even if you wanted to do it now, it'd be highly doubtful that it would even be successful, with the exception when all hell does break loose, probably primary in the big, cities well people do though people do tra oh you mean form communities okay i thought yeah you meant, like like people I'm talking about organically trading their labor for for, no, for I'm things just talking because about, i mean we do if, that all the time yeah they they've already got stuff in place because they they have a i don't remember what the name of the organization is something about rainbow something i can't think of it they've been around for years where they have these festivals and they get together and there's people out there that have the crafts that they made at home and paintings. And it's, it's more like a Renaissance type festival. And they, they said that the FBI actually goes out there and is watching folk and, uh, you know, uh, you know, writing down license plates and all this stuff. And all those people are doing is coming together and, and trading food and, and different things because they want to live off the grid kind of thing. And right. you don't hear about right. it because well, they don't want threat. you to know about it. Right. The independence is the threat, not but it's not the nature of of trade um, and like in and of itself. That's you know actual capitalism is a threat to their control. Yeah, I mean, I think if the fundamental operates on a pure profit motive. Then it then then it it operates outside their control. They're, they they right. artificially I, I... control and manipulate everything because the, and and it would be a threat if we actually did have a pure capitalist system. That's why they don't allow it. And I think the main the main tenant essentially, I know there's a lot of things that are, are thrown in and, and, and lines get blurred and things like that, but the main tenant essentially of capitalism is private ownership. Whereas I think every other yeah. uh financial system does not have that. And so that's the fundamental thing uh that that's is different actually. between capitalism. And for me, I I see it it most lines with God's economy, uh not not in grace or anything like that. I'm just saying and I don't think it'll be this way in, in eternity, but uh, given that the sin nature um, that you know, I see in the Old Testament, it's most uh, conforms to capitalism. Uh, with, the, with again, because with he again, does uphold private property. Right, right. And not everybody has an equal amount, like he, you know, of private property. Right, like he doesn't guarantee that every single, per, you know, that some some were greater than others, and it, it, it you know, it was based largely upon who worked the hardest for it. 
Um, and I think that's why, you know, God says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Um, which, it, you know, I just don't know of another alternate, like, I don't know of another, it's just a word, capitalism. I mean, you know, I'm sure there's plenty, there are other words for what we're describing throughout history. Well, but what we're talking about is just basically that, just the idea of having private property that you can choose to trade for things, right. you know, instead I of think being forced I think you're thinking share. of what Joshua pointed out in the chat. He said, I think you mean, he's, I, I think Angel means to say fair trade, not capitalism. Uh, and, I, and, and I think that I don't have a problem with trade. It's just the idea that, you know, the roots of capitalism are dark. They were not, it was well, not I, all just. Well, the roots of capitalism go far, far. I mean, like, whatever, what are we talking about when we talk about capitalism? That's why we have to actually properly define it. If you're just talking about the idea of like of, of colonialism, that's not capitalism. That's not where it began or ended. Um, it, you know, any system where people had um, private property that they could choose to trade, you know, was essentially a capitalist system. Um, you know, we had feudalism. I think there was a lot of feudalism going on, but it really, in, in reality, the, the, the royalty was just the ones that had the most property. And then as a, as a result, they could, they could force people into essentially into slavery um, on their land, but it was because those people were at a disadvantage, but you know, I, I, I don't, um, I don't think that, that these, the, 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 the concept is inextricably linked with corruption. It's just corruption is, is innate to the human uh, nature. So yeah, it, you know, I, I don't it, know that we could, I mean, as long as there are going to be people who are going to be, unfair and dishonest which is the nature of some folks some people are okay with that other people would bother their conscience but um as long as that's going on that's why you're not going to have per i agree it's not going to be a perfect system i just noticed that in the bible that was what they were doing in under the new covenant in the book of acts they didn't even they weren't even going i'm not saying they wouldn't have honored any of the laws in the old covenant, of course they would have as far as uh, being fair and honest and kind. That's why Paul said, hey, don't even go to the government. Don't sue your brother in the government. Work it out amongst yourselves. You don't want to get, yeah. he's saying, don't get the state involved in your business. But um, Joshua asked something in the chat. He is asking this to someone else, but I want to answer it anyway. He's asking someone else, can your government take your land for the greater good? Well, here in America, they call it well, eminent, eminent domain. domain. <laughs> yes, they do it all the time. No, um, it's not private property. <laughs> That's so, why taxes in and of itself violate the notion of private property. That's why I'm saying, like, I don't, I don't. You're cutting out, Angel. I, I'm saying even the notion of taxes violate the notion of private property because we can't actually even own our land once we've paid for it. Oh, absolutely. I do agree. The power to tax is the power to destroy. I don't, but I don't in the remember Old said Testament, were, were, is Israel particularly fair or benevolent to outsiders? Because, like, I understand yes, what they, was expected with Israel, within Israel. But, I mean, uh, when God commanded them to, you know, to conquer and slay uh, the outsiders, well, no, they you, did it. Are they, well, that's two different things. You just went, you kind of went. Two different places. I mean, one is when judgment has fallen on a nation for something, and the other, when you're talking about if Israel had set up camp somewhere and a stranger came mm -hmm. to want to dwell with them, as long as the stranger was willing to abide by what their customs were, they were supposed to receive mm -hmm. the stranger and treat them in kind. And there were laws to protect right. the strangers as well. So, um, and actually, one of the reasons Sodom and Gomorrah was uh, punished because they, they, uh, yeah. Did not treat str uh, strangers uh, uh, hospitably. Yeah, that's right. They could. They right. the judges were so wicked in Sodom, and a lot of people don't know this because no, everybody wants to skip through all <laughs> all the the the, the hard uh, uh, punishments in the old covenant. So they they missed this. But the judges were so wicked that they had passed a law that they could cast a bed openly in the street. And as long as they raped a man publicly, it wasn't against the law. <laughs> so if a stranger came through and he didn't know that was the law, it could still happen to him. So this was a complete violation of, of God's law and his concept about being kind to strangers. And as long as the stranger is dwelling peaceably with you, you're supposed to be peaceable and 
uh, act in in accordance and kindness to them as well. So this is one. This is the main reason Sodom was judged. It's interesting but, too. It says well, that 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 the old and young came and beat on the doors and said, "Let us in." So it was institutionalized pedophilia, essentially. Um, you know, the young and the old, the say the children and the men, well, uh, demanded to lie with, wanted to lie with the yes, angels. Yes, yeah. I remember. Well, and so I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, uh, Israel had the benefit of knowing that their their God was the true God, and so that His judgment was absolute and just. But the the thing is, though, is that uh, uh, other nations and uh, uh, you know um, other tribes and and people that you know were not believers. Um, and we're just let's just talk about like just unbelieving uh, nations, right? They don't have that benefit yet that they still think what they believe is true, right? And so it just the difference is is Israel actually was right to to slay and to conquer, right? Because God told them to do it. But it's still the same base that, you know, they they didn't uh, treat their enemies any differently when the time came is what I'm saying that compared to, you know, nations who were not under the guidance and command of God, right? But it's just sort of like the same behavior. I'm just saying that, like, God didn't really pull his punches in those situations, right? So uh, it, it didn't seem that he he felt that um, the outsider was inherently, uh, like, the outsider, the unbeliever was inherently entitled to um, to the same treatment, you know, give, depending on the circumstance, right? If it was, you know, he decided that it was time for them to go you know, that's, you know, they handled them and it was not, you know, I mean, they didn't like, you know, just go euthanize them with some type of like, you know, sleepy drug. I mean, it was pretty brutal. Right. That's all I'm trying to say is that like, it doesn't seem, I don't know that um, the way that like, I don't think it's so hard to put this God doesn't seem like he thinks mankind is, you know, especially like the, uh, you know, the unbeliever is inherently entitled to, uh, to, to the same treatment as those who are believers or who are, are within, within the fold. Right. So it just, it seems like, you know, that's why, that's why we see some of the brutality that we see in the old covenant. But I'll, also I, I do agree that um, this was a picture of the brutality of trying to live under the law. Right. And that's something a lot of people don't get is that, you know, what they see in the old Testament, they, you know, they think, well, that's an ugly God. That's an, that's a, that's an angry God. That's a, that's a violent God. But you know, this was, this was him, um, you know, guiding a people who, you know, were, you know, living by the law and it was not, it, there was supposed to be a huge juxtaposition between that and the new covenant, the new Testament, which we do see it totally different. It's a totally different mindset, right? Because we're not supposed to go to war with people just because they don't believe, right? We're not supposed to go and to enforce our religion upon them. Um, we're not supposed to, uh, we're really supposed to actually, in a lot of ways, be self-sacrificing because we're already, we're already good. We're covered. We're safe. So we're supposed to kind of almost prioritize their salvation above our own lives in some ways, um, in the sense that, uh, that's our commission, right? That's like what we're not supposed to, um, for instance, establish a Christian nation and go and slay the, the unbeliever necessarily that's not really you know whatever god deems will uh be most you're right. uh you're right effective on. right yeah so it's sort of like a self-sacrificing thing that's why i look at with like immigration and stuff on the one hand immigration is like especially unchecked illegal immigration is bad for the country um this country or any country really a christian nation right having tons of of people from the outside flooding in you know and causing this cultural uh atomization at the same time uh, i think it's there's a reason why god is has caused the 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 christian world to to be these hosts you know almost to all these foreign nations because it um it unavoidably exposes people that would have not otherwise been exposed to uh uh to christianity um and so it's sort of like what's what's uh what's bad for the carnal uh you know world the, the you know the, the the notion of like say america you know in the flesh right it's actually good for the the cause of the gospel because like i've, I've pointed out before there you know i know a lot of uh even my family some of my family in texas like they're mexican right I, I can only assume they would have been catholic had they never left mexico or something else right but mainly catholic 
Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, my Mexican family, they are actual, you know, I guess you could say evangelical Christians. I don't think they would have been that had they stayed in Mexico. You see what I'm saying? Because they would have only really been exposed to the Catholic Church. Okay. I'm sorry. I was reading something in the chat. Yeah, it does. But there were also other... Mia, I'm just going to say it. I, ho- I, I know you can hear me. Can you send me the link to that, please, uh, at four, the number four, the most high Jesus at protonmail.com. I'll put it here in the chat. Send me the link to that video. I want to see that because if that's true, I'm going to have something to say about that. Um, <clears throat> she, uh, she said that, uh, and this is totally off topic, uh, she just heard that Robert Breaker and Peter Ruckman uh, had condemned interracial marriage, saying that the couple is not what? saved. And I've heard that. I don't believe that. Uh, I do. I do. I've heard. I've Ruckman heard him. Maybe. No. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Wow. Nope. Somebody pulled my coattails about him too. On the whole. Yeah, I've never in, listened to him, but I just thought he. I don't know. I didn't inter- know what he was thing. There's only two races, really. There's the race yeah. of giants that's talked about in the scriptures, and then there's the race of humanity. Period. And there's the lost and the saved. Also, yeah, too, well, but God, it's still humanity. A lot of people right, have right, problems right. with those, A lot of people have problems with those passages in the Old Testament where God judged it took you know judged the land, killed everyone in the in the children. Uh, a couple things though. Uh, first of all, um, I said first of all that they couldn't take the land until the iniquity uh, of those people had come uh, had, had become full essentially. So God was being patient with them. And then when they're when they didn't uh, again repent, uh, essentially they um, they especially when he saw Israel coming, you know they they uh, didn't they didn't repent, and they actually it says so again they, their their cup of iniquity had reached a point. Uh, God was giving them grace to change, but you know again over oh, I think it was like four hundred years he gave them, or maybe two hundred years to uh, allow their their cup of iniquity to fill up, and even before they came in and judged. Uh, God sent uh, sent them out and, and tried to make terms of peace for them first with each of those uh, cities first, and if they, they didn't want to make p- terms of peace, then then they judgment was um, befell them. Um, and you may say, "Well, what about the children?" Well, there's some things that a child will see at an early age and see in their early life; they can never recover from that. You, you know, you can't. Well, also, they would go to heaven. Yeah. I, I, I believe that too. And, and, uh, and again, I think God, it was an act of mercy. Cause again, there's some things that you, you're exposed to as a child. You just can't recover from. And I think well, it, and it's plus, pretty clear. Even if, even if some did, the fact is if all the children die in the village, as opposed to like they lived and grew up, maybe like 5% would become saved believers as opposed to them all dying and be go and going to be with God. You see like a really huge act of mercy actually. Right. Yeah, and um, we talked about this on another broadcast. Remember when we were talking about Planned Parenthood, and I, I think they've mm-hmm. topped over 60 million uh, murders of uh, unborn children, and that how it's a trade-off for the devil. Yeah, he gets his blood sacrifice, which is what that stuff is all about. Mm-hmm. But he populates God, heaven in the process. Exactly. So he doesn't win. You know, on that. And yes, it is tragic, but I do believe those babies, I can't prove it, but I believe those babies get to go to heaven and have the best childhood ever. Now, I thought Ruckman was dead. So, first of all, I didn't know he was so alive. He is, but he taught that stuff. So, (laughs) they were saying that something you do can make you not save. Like, that's, I I mean, that I'm, I thought he was a hyper He's a hyper dispensationalist as well. I think he teaches Uh that. In the Old Testament and in tribulation period, you it's faith plus works. So he's a hyper. Well, we're not in that. So how come interracial marriage could make you not saved or like that's what you know? Like I'm just trying according to his logic. I just want to know where he finds the scripture of grace. Yeah, I want to know where he finds the scripture for that in the New Covenant because the Bible just simply says, "Be ye not unequal, unequally yoked with an unbeliever." That's it. Yeah. One yeah, man, exactly. one woman. And and a believer. That's it. Yeah. Well, I and mean, I'm not commenting. Please, Jordan, you have been too quiet too long. 
<laughs> well, it's because I don't want to forget my one point about um, <laughs> cancel culture from the get go. But I do want to add something here because and I'm not saying this pertains to all dispensationalists, but it's something that I've noticed a lot about dispensational preachers. They teach this um, sin of interracial marriage. And even in the old covenant, um, we need to real. let me pull it up here. I think it's a numbers one second, but what I'm going to is the fact that Moses married a Cushite, I believe. How do you say that? <laughs> but basically yeah, that Cushite. was, thank you. And that was mm-hmm. an interracial marriage and we see, okay, so it's numbers 12. Um, so Mary Miriam paid a big price for the same. Oh thing yeah. Oh Yeah. So that's what I was getting at. I always point at. that out to them, and they never have an answer. They just say, I'm brainwashed. They say, I hate my people. All these like people that are like, they, they don't have an answer for that. They just get mm-hmm. mad. Yeah, that's as, just dumb. As we get down to the wire, we starting to see a lot of weird stuff, y'all. And so I said, uh, you know, uh, I have a meme for that in case you didn't notice. The one about, you know, the truth will be the strangest thing you ever hear because of all this doctrinal error that's out there. Sometimes this truth will be the strangest thing you ever hear. Okay, guys, we are over here on the end of the broadcast. And I want to make sure that everybody gets to say their closing, uh, whatever their closing thoughts are. So, Ben, you've had a lot to say tonight. I hope you didn't strain your voice too much. (laughs) <laughs> your presentations i appreciate your participation this tonight because it was wonderful and i enjoy hearing uh how your mind works about things so uh in closing what would you like to say to everyone this evening uh just a really great discussion once again very worthwhile edifying learned learned a lot give you a lot to think about um and I think we should probably take up the subject again and, and uh, you know, maybe we should phrase it as was Jesus a socialist um, or a and, racist <laughs> uh, part, and parse that out, you know, see, see what. Uh, yeah. Yes. And where, or, where did, you know, did the, the Lord teach that the racists should mix? Because where are they getting this crap from? It's not it's in the Bible. The, right. Given into the flesh, he's getting all amp- he's getting all wild up because of the crap in the media regarding the flesh. Exactly yep, that's what, that, and that's exactly what it's intended to do. So good job, Robert Baker. All right, hey, Angel. I was about to come to you. It looks like you got plenty to say. So go ahead, go ahead and closing. I know. I just, I just, <laughs> I'm just so tired of people being so like just trying anything to take pride in other than Jesus. I just try to glory in something. And I, I just, you know, that's just not God. God is <laughs> the opposite direction of where God has led me. I mean, He can always find me a way to cut me down to size if I start to glory in anything. And to me, I think that that is. Um, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I just it's just it's just pride and it's just uh, uh, you know, bitterness. And he really, I just think I don't know if this is a new thing that he's teaching, but if it is, it's not a surprise because. We have, no. you know, that's just the entire point of all this crap in the media right now is to get people tribally minded, carnally minded, prideful um, in their flesh and, um, and, and, and hateful towards others and, mm-hmm. um, and, and in, a, in a righteously indignant way, too. And, um, you know, but I mean, he's got a lot of his own problems. I know that there is a. Uh, a brother in Christ named Max Bauer. He has a great channel. Uh, I believe uh, he told me he's friends with Victoria and uh, mm-hmm. he has a great channel that has, uh, you know, I, I, I think he goes in on, on breaker and Jean Kim uh, pretty well in and in, a, in a several different videos. So I uh, recommend Does that. I, I really that like, stuff? huh? Does he teach that the ethnicity? No, no, he rebukes it. He rebukes. Oh, Gene Kim. No, yeah, Gene Kim. Know. Oh, wow. Yeah, apparently. I didn't know that either. Yeah. So yeah, you got to watch He's enough a- of these people's content to catch certain things, and I haven't. So I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, he's also a uh, hyper dispensationalist as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what he yeah. teaches. I don't know about this race thing, but he teaches about. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, apparently, if it comes with the territory. But, um, yeah, he, he I didn't know that until I saw Max Bauer's channel that Gene Kim uh, taught that. 
way. So, um, but I have asked him to maybe Matt come on our show one day. Yeah, he's okay. the one I talked to you about. Yeah, yeah, he's wonderful. But I oh, okay, to, you sent me the link. Okay, good. That. I'll check it yeah, out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he's yeah he's a, he's a. It was great to stumble upon him inadvertently, and um, uh, he was actually doing a great breakdown of Owen Benjamin's uh, heresy, and uh, I saw it. I, it's just crazy because I didn't know he knew Victoria. I didn't know he was like kind of like part of our circle. He was shared on a on a, a larger like very secular channel, and um, it was just awesome because he. I, as soon as I watched some more of his videos, I realized he really understood the true gospel. And, you know, you just never see that. You come across a random Christian on YouTube, and nine times out of ten, as soon as it gets down to the nitty-gritty, you, you realize they don't have – at least you don't know where they stand on the gospel or they have the false a false gospel. So, um, well, yeah. But, yeah, it's been – huh? No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's been – it's been an awesome discussion tonight, and I just heard – Oh, there you Okay, never mind. <laughs> I heard a weird noise. Um, but um, but I uh, I'm so glad Ben talked to, uh, piped up some more because uh, you know when when we can get him going, he has a whole lot of interesting things to say. So um, yeah. I'm really excited to hear what he's he has to reveal next week about uh, the light bulb that went off for him tonight. So oh, um, we won't be yep, we, I, won't, uh, we won't be together oh, next right. week. We're off next week. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, ne- next time. Okay. Then. So, and Jordan, I uh, it was great to uh, to have you back as always. And, yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> I guess that's gonna be a regular thing now. Yeah, he's a fixture now. I don't know what we're gonna do about that. <laughs> I thought he was already. I didn't even know that that I thought that because I had missed uh, one of the shows. So I thought I already thought that he was, and then uh, I found out that that was just uh, uh, officially uh, confirmed. Uh, I guess last week, so it's awesome. We 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 uh, we could definitely use you. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just me and Lisa talking half the time. Uh, okay. And then and, and not getting the word in edgewise. So. <laughs> or well, then, but see, y'all, I don't know. We might have to find another person because Jordan already has two strikes on my list. So <laughs> I, it's right. doubtful he's going to make it through the next broadcast. <laughs> Jordan, what would you like to say? I'm kidding, you guys. Jordan, what would you like to say uh, in closing to everyone this evening? Well, just remember, she said she's just kidding, guys. But if I'm not here next time, you know something's up. (laughs) I just want to circle back around real quick to make my comment about um, the cancel culture real quick because that was something I really wanted to speak on tonight. Um, And so I totally get the point about the... Um, cancel culture boycott. In that sense, I don't have a problem with it. The cancel culture that I have a problem with are the teen girl K-pop fans that hop on to get their um, celebrity streaming so they'll take one controversial phrase, get a hashtag going on Twitter, and completely destroy someone's life who absolutely had nothing to say. We see it all the time. Cancel culture is eventually going to turn against people like us because basically just everything that we said tonight is worth canceling. And when we are canceled, we do not get a job. We cannot function in society. We have death threats. We have people who spit on us in public. We have food thrown at us. I've seen it all happen. And cancel culture is reshaping society. And it's even changing our theology. It's starting with Dr. Seuss books now, but we already have people on TikTok making viral videos saying that Jesus is a racist. How long before cancel culture Culture comes for our Bibles. Other mm-hmm. than that, it was a wonderful night. That's it. That's all you had to say. I mean, just I, mean, I had random. more. I had more, but I like <laughs> I, now. I feel like I'd just be holding everyone up, and we've already like been past that for like an hour. So I just no, had to we'll, say that. Though. We will come back to cancel culture when we come back together, and I'll let you lead with that because when we spoke about it, that was the point that Jordan made. That's like, where did he go? But I didn't want to. You know, draw attention that he fell asleep at the switch if he did. So, <laughs> uh, excellent points, Jordan. And yes, it is. There's a, it's almost like anything, anything in this world has a catch 22 if it's taken to an extreme, one way or the other. You know, it will come back to bite you. It's like trying to play with the devil with a long handled spoon. So, I really do appreciate you drawing attention to that aspect. I think Angel did touch on it some too, as well, in fairness. So, um, we'll come back and we'll talk about that some more because that's a very good point that um, now it's, it's like this extreme that they can just destroy someone's life that had nothing to do with anything. Mm-hmm. 
technically they've kind of always been able to do that. And I'll point to some examples when we come back to and talk about it. Um, it's it's how the media can destroy someone. It wasn't even true and you didn't even know it, but the objective was to take them out. And they've been doing this forever. This is an old game. So I want to really thank um, my friends here tonight for their time. I want to thank all of you guys for hanging with us. It is now almost 5 a.m. on the East Coast. Can you believe it? You guys stayed up uh, all night with us. Out here on the West Coast, it's actually still early. It's not even 1 a.m., but uh, it is the next day. And some people do have to get up early and go to church uh, tomorrow. So uh, I wanted to thank all of you for taking the time to listen, no matter when you're listening to this broadcast. So we will not be uh, together next week. I always like to give my friends the night off to spend time with their family and friends to kick their feedback and not have to do a blooming thing if they don't want to. So next week we all have the night off and then we'll be coming back the following week to uh, talk about some more of these things and some other ideas that I have some topics for, as I'm sure Ben, Angel, and I know Jordan has something to say. So we'll be back to discuss those things on the next broadcast of Late Night with Lisa and friends. God bless you all in the mighty name of King Jesus. Good night and good morning. This is the gospel message, and I just pray that you will open your heart and let it change your life. We were fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God to declare his glory and reveal his majesty. The problem is that one of the angels of God wanted to be higher than God himself and therefore this angel was cast out of heaven, becoming the fallen angel, or as we know him, the devil. One day in the Garden of Eden, there was Adam and Eve, the first humans and the fallen angel appeared to them in the form of a serpent and tempted them to sin against God, and they did, causing mankind to fall. God was angered and he casted Adam and Eve from the garden and told the serpent that he was going to send one who would crush the serpent's head and the serpent would bruise his heel. You have to understand that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and because of that, we all deserve an eternal separation from God, which is hell. But God loved the world so much that he became man, and that man's name was Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life by fulfilling all the requirements of the law in order to become the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He was spat on, mocked, and beaten, and people even gambled over his clothes. He was whipped to the point where his flesh was torn from his body and a crown of thorns was crushed into his skull. He was then forced to carry his cross to the site where he would be nailed to it. Jesus then used his last bit of energy after hanging on the cross for several hours to say, It is finished. And then he commended his spirit to the Father. Jesus was then buried. But three days later, he rose from the grave, conquering sin and death. Don't you see? God passed the law that would cause the Jews to sentence his incarnate form to death. The law was the schoolmaster to lead us to Christ and allow us to see our need for a savior. The law was a shadow of good things to come. The promise came before the law. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This is our Savior. Now, whosoever believes in Jesus Christ as your Savior by trusting in his life, death, burial, and resurrection will be saved. He will take on your sin, and you will take on his imputed righteousness. This is the love of God, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Call out to him today. Confess him as your Lord. When you trust only in the blood of Jesus Christ to be your salvation from sin, you will be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise as a down payment of guarantee of eternal life until the day of deliverance. The Holy Spirit is the seed of God which is planted in you by Jesus Christ through faith in him. This is what allows you to be presented before a holy God as blameless. 
The Holy Spirit then baptizes you into the body of Christ, making you part of the ecclesia, meaning the church or the called out ones. Your heart will be circumcised and you will be sanctified, meaning you will be set apart from your flesh. We are eternally secure in him because he who begins a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. And daily we will work out our salvation with reverent fear and rejoice and trembling as we conform to the image of Jesus Christ. We become disciples of Jesus and that discipleship journey will look different for everyone. So do not compare yourself to other Christians, but only to Jesus Christ because he is the only standard we strive for. Repent today, that is to turn towards Jesus. Do not let man deceive you into thinking that you must drop all your sins before you come to Jesus. Jesus wants you to come just as you are because he came to call the sinners to repentance, not the righteous. Those who are given to him by God and seek him, he shall in no way cast out. Stop clinging on to the branches of religion and instead come to know the true vine, that is Jesus Christ, because without him, there is no victory, there is no deliverance, and there is no healing. We can do nothing without him. He is our savior from the penalty of sin. He is our savior from the power of sin. And eventually he will be our savior from the presence of sin. He himself took on the penalty of your sin that you would find forgiveness and redemption from your sin today. He desires a relationship with you and heaven is waiting to rejoice when you turn to him. Receive the free gift of salvation today through faith in Jesus Christ and enter through the narrow gate that leads to eternal life with your heavenly Father. Amen.